So once, once again, good morning, and let's start uh, with our session. We are going to have session five, that's research theory, and we, we will, or theory in research, where we explain what a research framework is. We discuss theoretical and conceptual frameworks. I hope you had a very good weekend. Okay, so to start off, our session today seeks to explain the role of theories and then um, in the research process. And we want to try to introduce students to different research theories and conceptual models relevant for business and social science research. You may have heard about the concept of our theories for quite some time now, and we will be asking and wondering what are theories. So that's what we'll try to do today. And all I'll try to do cover in my session is to define the research framework, explain the types of research frameworks, and then um, build building blocks of a theory, examples of theories, level of a theory. So those are the sessions that I'm going through in the session topics that I'll be going through today. And this is from chapter five of the book that you have already. So let's start. So defining define a research framework. Now, even though I've said we are going to talk about theories, I just, uh, you will be asking why is Prof talking about research framework? The theory perform part of your research framework. So it's better I explain what a research framework is so that you can have an understanding of what we use frameworks and research to do. Okay, so anybody can, taking a research endeavor comes to a point in time where after doing a literature review, he needs to try to explain the theoretical concepts that actually underpin the research area he's trying to carry the research on. And then he also, or the phenomenon he's trying to study. And that same person has to think about um, exploring these different theories so that you can be able to develop some kind of frame to guide the research. Because without the research framework, the challenge that you have is that you can ask so many questions. <clears throat> but the research framework presents the way of studying variables and concepts concerning a phenomenon in order to investigate that particular uh, research or um, a phenomenon or investigate a solution for that research problem. So what the research framework does is that it outlines the relationship between the variables and concepts in a manner which explains or predicts the social phenomenon within a, a, a specific or specified research problem. So let's just use this as an example. And uh, supposing um, I'm going to buy a piece of land and I need to know the area of the piece of land I'm supposed to buy. Almost all of us here will say that we just have to multiply L, um, the length of the land times the breadth, and I can get the square area of the area that the, the land, um, 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 the area that defines the land, and I can have an understanding of the space that is available to me. So sometimes you may hear 100 meters by 70 meter uh, plot, and that plot that, um, um, that multiplication gives me an, a concept of the space that I'm trying to um, purchase. Now, what it means is that you multiply the length times the breadth. But who told you that you should multiply the length and the breadth to get the area? It's because you know, as a given, that to find the area of a shape that is like a, a, a rectangle, you have to multiply the length times the breadth. So what, the, what that particular formula has become a, it's become a frame for you to be able to address the social phenomenon that you have, or that phenomenon that you have that you needed to buy, you need to find the area of the piece of land that you are going to buy, or the piece of plot that you're going to buy. So that particular formula now becomes the frame for you to find the area. Now that rectangular object that you are in, the formula is for a rectangular object, which is a given, and has been established in literature already, and has been established far before maybe you were even born. So, you, and there's a given in science that L times B of a rectangle will give you the area. So all of you did was just to apply it. So in that particular endeavor you had, what became the frame for that endeavor was the existing theory for, the, for a rectangular object, which was length times breadth. So the research framework takes existing theories or existing postulations about phenomenon to try to study current source of phenomenon that may be, we may face in reality. So that's why it does. So in, in that scenario, my architect is going to tell me, or the, the person who is selling, selling the land, 
or I myself can be able to do the calculation and say that this land is 70 by 100 or this land is 100 by 60 or 60 by 50. Why? Because I've got a formula that guides me in being able to understand how I can find the area of this particular piece of plot. So the research framework is presents the way of studying the variables concerning the phenomenon in order to investigate the solution for the research problem. So let's, con let's continue on. Okay. So it is called the research framework because it frames the research or, um, or gives uh, the limits of the result, defines what variables can come into play. For example, the area of a land, you know the variables that come into play with the, with the length and then the breadth. So it tells you that these variables or concepts come into play. It tells you the relationships between the variables. Zola tells you the relationship between the variables. So I use that one to guide me in trying to define the area of that particular piece of plot I'm trying to buy. Okay. So, um, go, going further, where does the, um, for a typical long essay or thesis, if you are doing a master's thesis, one thing that you see is that um, the literature review, within the literature review, somebody will discuss the research framework. However, for a, a PhD program, you have a different chapter which we call the theoretical foundations, in which you are going to give us the theory, theoretical basis of your framework. And then maybe you could actually, some supervisor may push you to have, after you explain your theoretical basis, then develop the framework that you are going to use. And you have another chapter called research framework. So you can have two chapters, one be your theoretical foundation, another being your, uh, being another chapter called the research framework. But with a, a long essay, which is usually in a, an MBA program, you end up seeing that the research framework is usually part of the initial review. So I'm just wanting to make that um, and, um, relationship clear for you. So look at how it look like for the PhD student. So a PhD student can have um, chapter one be introduction, chapter two be literature review, then chapter three be theoretical foundations. And sometimes some supervisors may tell you to combine, other supervisors may tell you to split it. Other, other supervisors may tell you to split it. So sorry about the numbering here. This is supposed to be, the last one is supposed to be eight. Okay. So let's see. This is an, a, a piece of work that was published in 2011, and the author had the title as "What is the impact of mobiles or micro trading activities of market traders?" So the author then had a number of different questions. One question being, "How do market traders use mobiles?" Question being, "What benefit do market traders obtain from mobiles?" The third question was, "What is the impact of, benef of benefits of using mobiles in micro trading activities of market traders?" So you see that you have one, two, three different questions. Now each of the question try to tell us, come to the, each of the question try to answer an aspect of the core research purpose or the core research objective. So in that scenario, if he is going to, the person carrying out the research is going to address it in the, in, in, as a social phenomenon who is trying to, in which he's trying to collect data, what is going to happen is that he needs to find, develop a framework that uh, will help him address each of the questions. So then how is he going to do that? So this is an example that's transcribed from the paper that was written, but it's actually based on the theory of transaction cost theory. So he argues that, uh, and a number of different theories here, I think for his, uh, the first one is the fact that he tried to conceptualize this as the traders adopt mobile phones and they use it for as, um, different activities in trading. So there are stages of trading, pre-trade, during trade and post trade, and those lead to benefits and those lead to impact. But in reality, there are a combination of different conceptual approaches or conceptual um, and foundations here. One of it is that this stages of trading is, is coming from economics. That tells you about the, the, the three stages of trading. That's uh, pre-trade, during trade, and post trade. Then these benefits are can built upon um, other literature in information technology that explains based on the transaction cost theory, the relationship between um, IT and, uh, and, and commerce. So it talks about the fact that when you apply IT to commerce, you can get strategy, strategic benefits, relational benefits and operational benefits. And then the last one is about mobiles and impact, which is comes from another work, body of work, which looks at the um, outcomes of using or the, the impact of using mobiles by uh, in, a, in, a, in a given uh, business activity. And he talks about incremental effects and this transformational effects and production effects. And these are all coming from literature works that people have done. 
So he takes all these conceptual approaches or, or, or foundations and put them together to be able to address his work. So the question then comes as that the first question, how do um, market women trade? Um, how do market women use mobiles in their training? So it looks at the different stages of trade and that will be on this section. Then what benefits do you obtain? And that will be on this section. And what is the impact of those benefits? Um, what is the impact of the mobiles on, 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 on the business itself? Then these are the impact uh, variables that he's going to look into. So now you have them coming together in the process model to explain or a process framework to explain the impact of mobiles or micro trading, so which have been built, <coughs> which have been built out of a review of literature. Okay, somebody is asking, is there a standard required number of chapters for PhD PhD work, especially in those in the social sciences? I don't think so. I think it was more, what matters much more is whether you have everything there to be able to come up with contribution to your contributing to your knowledge. Even with the MBA one, there, there's no standard number, but have you have the, you have all the key sections? Do you have the introduction? Do you have the literature review? Do you have the conceptual, the theoretical foundations and the research framework? Do you have the methodology? Do you have the context of the methodology? The context of the study? Do you have things like the, the, the findings or the data you collected? And then do you have the analysis of the data? Do you have the um, in discussion of the analysis? And then do you have the conclusion? So these are the key things that we expect to see in your work. You may order them in a particular way that will become eight, nine, sometimes more than that. Depends on what a person's work is about. Okay. So now let's look at types of research framework. Now we have a better, we, we established a basic understanding of what a, a research framework is and then how we, what we use it, or how an example, I will show you an example of it. But before I can explain what we use it for, I want to try to emphasize here about the different types so that I can be able to explain what, they, what we use them for. Okay. So there are different types of research framework, but they are all research frameworks. So in developing a research framework in an academic piece of work, there, are, there could be two approaches. There could be two approaches. The, one, one approach is somebody can pick an existing theory, which I'll explain later, and adapt it for his work and modify it his work. In that scenario, after he has adapted it, the thing becomes what you use for his work. And the outcome is that he has now taken the existing theory, adapted it to his work, and then he's now, move, um, he's now going to apply it to his work. Then somebody can also develop a framework, which we call a, a, a framework from the body of literature. So the, he thinks that the current literature is not sufficient, um, theories is not sufficient to address the problem. So it needs a, a maybe a different types of theories coming together. So what he does is that he reviews the different literature, identifies different different theories or different different um, outcomes of existing studies and, and relationship, and use that one to formulate a new um, framework or a new a new understanding that tells us the relationship between these same variables and uses that one to do his work. Now, as soon as you try to develop something from the literature, which is has not is not is um, has not is yet to be tested. We usually say that you are now moved to a conceptual state, state because you are now suggesting that this is now the what could happen in the phenomenon. The same way, when you pick a theory and you modify it and apply it to your work, you actually move from the theoretical state and then move to a conceptual state. The research framework actually li lives in a conceptual state. What my conceptual state is that the thing is a, a, a postulation of relationship between variables which you are going to apply in your research. So because it's a postulation, or because it's a hypothesis, or because it's your suggested perspectives of what could happen, uh, the relationship that exists between variables, we, are, we actually say that you have left a theoretical state to a conceptual state or an abstract state, or a conceptual state in which you are not going to apply, you are suggesting that this relationship could occur. Because in carrying out a research, you will have to act, tell us that, okay, this relationship that um, this phenomenon I'm studying, how am I going to address it? So I read the existing literature and I find a theory. So I said, okay, this theory explains how to find the, um, the area of a rectangular object, but I'm going to buy this piece of land. This land is by, um, and this land is, this piece of land is, is at this particular location. So for me to be able to know the area, I need to measure the length and the breadth. So I'm going to apply it. But in the reality, so in the, in the theoretical state, it's saying that length is spread, but the reality when you get to the 
actual ground and you want to know the actual value of land and, and, and the, its area, you may have to take into account that as you are measuring the land, sometimes there could be a, a boulder there, there could be a river, or there could be a, an object there that you have to go around. So in, in principle, even though you are using the length times, but you have to use it in a way that is applicable to the piece of land. Because not all lands are cut to be straight. Sometimes, because of the topography of the land, the, 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 the length and the bed is just a theoretical area. But the actual space that you can build will be maybe there will be less or more than that because of the type of land that you are buying. So in the theoretical state, you are saying it's a length and bed. But as you move to the um, the conceptual state, when you get to the full and you're multiplying, you may realize that after you measure, you measure measure for some time, you have to stop and then add a little bit and um, cut and take this space, measure here, measure here and add it. And you realize you get an idea of what's accessible to you because of the, the topography of the land or even a river passing through a tree that you cannot remove or a part of the land that is earmarked for a particular um, uh, activity. Or even sometimes maybe an encroacher coming from a, a neighbor who has actually positioned his, built his wall into part of your land. All these things can things and that can happen in reality. So, when we talk about a research framework, we can develop it by either having a theory and then applying it to our research, or we can say that maybe we look at the existing literature, the existing theories is not sufficient, it can address what we want. So we do a, a number of different readings and we, we develop it from the literature. And then after that, we come to come up with our own um, uh, uh, postulation of relationships that could occur in the field. And then we, in that scenario, we use that one as um, our conceptual model for doing the work. Now, before I continue, I just want to pause here. I want you to go on, online, or maybe using Google Scholar, and download a paper and identify the research framework that you saw in the paper, and then see what was the theoretical foundation of the research framework. How was it developed? Was it developed out of the literature? review or to just develop by uh, taking an existing theory and explaining the theory. Do that within the next five minutes. I'll be asking you questions on what you have seen so far. Okay then. So go online right now and then uh, download from either using Google Scholar, just download, download in the academic paper. If you have an academic paper which is on your computer, you can also open it. I, will, I would like to hear from you what you are seeing. Okay. Okay, so I told you to go online right now and then um, try to download a paper to identify whether it's used a theory or uh, it's used um, a basis research framework on the literature. So I would like to hear from different people. Please, um, if you want to talk, you can just raise your hand on, in, the, in the chat room so that I could actually call you to tell. Aziz, um, if you could start with us. I'll be very glad. Aziz or, or even Yvonne, any of you who has, or Caleb, let me know who has it. So if you if you have something you have seen, kind of unmute yourself, and then you can let us see. You can just share what you have actually uh, found online with us. So Aziz, what have you found? Uh, I'm still trying to figure it out, Prof. You have not, you have not obtained the paper. I told you to download. Uh, yeah, I've obtained the paper. I'm trying to figure it out. OK. So who has figured it out? Yes. Hello, Prof. Prof. Yeah, <coughs> yes. Teresa, you can go. Yes, Prof. I saw a paper on a review of corruption in the health sector. That's in this paper. A review paper. Yes. So that then happen. he's uh, okay. Continue. I mean, it's a review review of corruption in the health sector, and he's written theory, methods, and interventions. And I'm seeing he has a theory on the health sector, how the system looks like. Okay. And then he developed a conceptual framework using the systems, and then combining the corruption, another framework on corruption. Okay. So you have seen something. I think that's a real yes. paper. So I don't think he actually collected data. He just tried to develop a, a, a conceptual model. A conceptual, yes. Good. From, so have seen from that review fact. of literature. Oh, good. You can review the literature, bring one theory and add it to some literature, or even just focus on just the literature. A number of market okay. researchers just like to take 
existing literature and develop a framework out of it. And then they, they use that one to carry out their research. Yes, um, I saw somebody else was trying to say something, yeah. Yes, um, Prof, this is Wakefield. Okay, Wakefield. Um, I have uh, an article, One Voter and Two Choices, The Impact of Electoral Context on the 2011 UK Referendum. Okay. Now, they developed the framework from literature that um, existed prior. Okay. But go going further, I still collected data. The authors yeah. collected data to enable them come to a certain conclusion. So in going through it, when you get to um, the data side, after, because the postulated hypothesis. Yes, that's, that, that's what we expect. The, the framework is going to frame the research. So what you right. develop is going to use, be used as the church car lens or the framework for the research. The word framework actually tells us it frames the particular work that is going to take place. So the work right. is the endeavor of the research. Okay, let me listen to you, yeah. Yeah, so um, the data um, collected, they tested the data, I mean, in the electoral and election context, I know. because this was going to be a new phenomenon of deciding whether to remain in the UK or, or uh, in the EU or exit the EU. Okay. You know, so that's what I have seen so far. Anyway. Okay, then. That's quite interesting. That, and what you are all doing is a quick read of an article. So I'm actually trying to teach you something that I was talking to you about last time. That you should be able to take an article and just go to within five minutes and know what is inside the article. So I was just trying to make sure that you are practicing before. But secondly, too, I'm helping you to identify what matters in articles. So you have been able to see whether a framework is relevant in, 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 in solving a particular problem. Another thing I've also seen is that some of the papers are conceptual. It means that they don't have data. So they may just develop a framework and leave it like that. Others have got data because they could develop the framework and then they go and collect data. Some people don't have any framework. They don't even have anything. They, don't, they just uh, collect data and, then, and, and just um, analyze it as far as possible. But usually in academ academic work like at the PhD level, the objective is to try to look at, um, especially at the theoretical foundation, to understand what are the existing theoretical approaches that have been used to be able to um, um, address the particular research phenomenon that you are, you are trying to um, research on. Okay, so Crepe, um, um, I think um, Christopher has some questions. So let's let's listen to Christopher. Yes, Prof. Good morning. Thank mm -hmm. you for the opportunity. To... Yeah. Um, I've, I've 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 gone through your article on uh, mobile phones and micro trading activities, conceptualizing the link. Okay. So I realized uh, the conceptualization was not particularly coming from literature, but then based on the interviews that oh, you, then you have not uh, read that were conducted. Then I'm not read the paper well. At the, at the, um, at the, after the introduction, the whole theoretical conceptualization is there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you will see that it's oh. based on transaction cost theory. You see that it's based on other discussions from different, different um, authors. And then we develop a framework from there. So that one happens oh. happen actually in the, in that one. Um, oh. um okay. Um, 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 um let me just take a second and see if I can just locate the paper and then show to so the benefit of the doubt, oh. use that one to just explain something to everybody so that we have an, an understanding of what we're looking at. Um okay. I know some people are just still joining us. Just give me a second, just give me a second. Okay. Oh. So on your screen that I'm sharing right now, you can see that I am, I'm looking at mobiles and micro trading activities, conceptualizing the link. When I scroll down, what you realize here is, when I scroll down, what you realize here is that there's an introduction and then there is a, a part called using mobile for micro trading. Look at the first statement that is said. Transaction cost theory is arguably the most commonly used theory in study issues relating to 
assess, assessment of the impact of ICT on commerce or trade. So the whole work is based on transaction cost theory. Then it goes on to explain the transaction cost theory, links with other different, different literature, and then develops this particular framework which I'm seeing here. So um, it's possible for you to base your work on reading existing literature and then looking at developing a framework from there. So that's what you see. It starts from the transaction cost theory. It explains the transaction cost theory. It talks about the different types of costs. It talks about actor motivation costs, and then um, and then you have got the coordination costs. After explaining the transaction cost theory, it talks about the fact that um, uh, we have to look at the the cost of trading or the the cost or in, in the transactions either that pre-trade, during trade, and post-trade, which is actually coming from economics um, um, literature, pre-trade, post-trade, and during trade. Then after that, it looks at how, relation, the, how technology comes in to relate with this whole trading, um, this whole transaction approaches. So that's what it does. So I just wanted you to have a look at it, yeah. Does any other student want to share what you have seen before we, we, we snap back to our session? You want to share what you have read? Anybody else? Yes, Benjamin Abugiri. Okay, please, Benjamin, you unmute yourself and talk. Yeah. Okay, Prof. Yeah. I uh, thank you very much. Okay. I have this article by um, Dr. Abdul uh, Abdullah Abdul Gafaru. Yeah, that's my on, friend. Yes, on the political economy of decentralization and the challenge of improved service delivery in urban Ghana. Okay. And then he um, the, he he used the political the political settlement theory. Okay. To I mean. Um, to build their understanding of the political economy of decentralization. Okay. Uh, and it, he also collected uh, data. He, he reviewed a number of literature and then he collected data and okay. um, to, to buttress his point. Okay. But in the article, what I didn't see is I didn't see um, the framework in um, in a diagrammatical or, or okay. in a so that, that's, that, that's a very good that's a very good um, observation which i'll come back to it not all theories have a, a visual form or um a diagrammatic form as you may call it not all not all theories have a visual form or diagrammatic form but i'll, I'll come back for example lentine's breath doesn't have the, any diagram for it you know that <laughs> lentine's breath doesn't have any diagram for it okay so I think Juma, I think Juma, can you unmute yourself? You're asking a question. I think Juma. I think Juma. Okay, since he's gone off. I think Juma, I think Juma. Isaac, can you unmute your can you talk? Hello? Okay, he's yeah, asking. Yeah, prof. Yeah, I can see that you have a question here about that. That's methodology of the study and the quantitative or qualitative matter. Determine the conceptual framework you should use. Can you have an initially defined research frame if you go into qualitative research? Yes. Yeah. The first one is that does um, the method matter? Okay. Hmm. It's yes or no. It depends on where you start from. The theory, you have to have a research framework. If you are going to be doing quantitative, then your research framework will have, end, end up having more of hypotheses so they can test them. If you are going to do qualitative, you are not going to mm. usually have hypotheses. Even if you want to talk about relation mm. between variables, you are going to have what we call propositions. So your research mm -hmm. framework, the, the type of study you are doing matters. And if you go into the papers, you will see it. Number two, um, okay. does, can you have it in a, in a qualitative research that you can start with a defined theory? Okay, it depends on what you are doing. If you are coming from an inductive approach, your theory is not bound, binding you. It's just giving you an understanding of the area and how you're going to look at the phenomenon. But it doesn't mean that you are tied to it. So you still have opportunity to explore. And even with inductive research, with interpretive or constructive research, you have got the flexibility of going forth and back. So sometimes they go in, look at the data a little bit, they see that the theory that they had in mind it doesn't apply. So they go back and then they change the theory and come back again and look at it. But if you are coming from a if you are coming from a, um, a, a a uh, positivist approach, you, you, you develop your research framework and you go and test it. So your objective here is testing whether the relationships are plausible. 
So that's your objective, which is quite different from those who are coming from an inductive approach. The, the deductive approach want to deduct, so that they want to test whatever they are postulated. Yeah. And if I come from a critical realist approach, then you are doing retroduction, where you do, you go forward and come back. So you are doing both induction and reduction at the same time. So it's possible to have some kind of theory to, to guide the research before you go in, but it depends on what you are going to do. With the inductive people, whilst they are doing the research, the theory can even modify and change. And they capture it as our part of the emergence, the emerging aspect of the, uh, uh, the process. So even with uh, uh, inductive research, you end up seeing that sometimes the part of the work is the contribution of how the theory itself was used and how it was emerged and changed from different forms within the particular work they were doing. Okay. How many theories could you combine to conceptual framework? It depends on what question you're asking and the questions that you have within your phenomenon. And if a phenomenon via, um, requires you to look into more, more relationships, you end up having looking for more theories to explain the relationship. So there's nothing like a defined number of theories you need, but it's much more about whether you're explaining your phenomenon in, in, in its totality, in a, manner, in a manner that everybody can understand. So thank you very much for the, the exercise that we have actually done. Uh, 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 hello, Prof. Yes. Hello, Prof. Yes. Uh -huh. so, so in terms of the uh, conceptual framework, yeah? Sorry, this is Isaac again. I know, I know. Um, you, you, you can have in the lit re literature review section an initial conceptual framework then after you've done the uh, primary research you can you can rehash the the conceptual framework and, and provide a theory no not is that right you are, you are confusing mm. yourself. okay so okay. um what you have Sorry. is that in your theoretical foundations of a phd or even of a master's work what you do is that you have a problem and you need to solve it so your your research framework is is, is a, your conceptualization of how to address the problem. Okay. You understand me? Then you collect data yeah. to either verify, add on, or test whatever you have said, or explain whatever mm -hmm. you have said, and modify it. So that by the time you finish, you would have to develop a framework that establishes understanding of why this thing works in a particular way. So your framework can yes. be part of your contribution. That one is an outcome of your study. That's why we call it a mm -hmm. study framework. That is one yeah. of with the inductive people, they start with the framework, they may start with the theory in mind, develop maybe a framework, and as they are doing it, they realize that there are so many different variables in the issue, so the theory is not working very well. They can go back and add a little bit more variables to it, or add a little mm. more understanding to it, and come back and look at the phenomenon very well, so that they can understand the phenomenon better. That's what I was trying to explain mm. to you. That is more of an inductive yeah. approach. Yeah. But at the end of the day, he will still end up telling you that this is my findings from the study, and this is the theories that I put together to come up to the finding. And because of this, future mm. study that want to do research in this area can look at the new uh, study framework that I have to be able to be mm -hmm. the foundation for their future study. Mm. Okay. That's right. So, but as we are doing, um, as we are doing the study, um, the, the readings, you understand what I'm trying to say. And uh, with the reproductive approach, it's the same approach. You go forth and back, and then I end up coming to develop. A framework. The paper that we are looking at, the mobile cell market, is a reproductive approach that we are using. You end up realizing that we actually, um, reproductive doesn't you know, mean that it's only the choice that you go forth and back. Even the way you look at the concept, even the way you analyze, is all part of the reproductive process. So, so when we get to analysis, I'll explain it in better. So let's look at the, the research framework very well. Now, what it means is that Every study, uh, every, uh, studies have research framework, but they can be inspired by theory or it can be inspired by a combination of reading literature. That's all I wanted to establish to do. That every research framework that you are developing, you can either take it to a theoretical dimension or you can just say that that in which you pick a, a bunch of theories and use, or you can say that the theories are not sufficient. You can read different literature, find out findings from other people's work, put them together, you could add a theory or not even add a theory and still postulate something and go and test it. However, for a PhD, because your contribution is to try to, your objective is to try to contribute to knowledge, we expect that there should be some theoretical foundations on your conceptualization. Don't just come mm -hmm. up just going to a PhD without no theory in anywhere. Especially if you are able to look at existing or emerging theories and see how best you can be able to lose it to apply to a phenomenon of study. 
However, with a master study, it is not necessarily a given that a person will pick a particular term as in a, he can also read the literature and develop a model out of the different factors that he's reading from the literature. I'm just letting you know how, how the differences are. So that's why sometimes you see a paper that doesn't have any theory mentioned explicitly, but has done different factors. Oh, this commitment factor, this trust factor, this um, 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 factor on um, um, patient's intention, or this factor on service quality, and you put them together to develop a model, and then he goes to carry out the study of it. So as I go on, you, explain, you understand this better. Okay, so let's continue. So now, because of the fact that you can build it from the theory perspective, I want to explain what the theory is. A theory is a, a coherent set of general propositions. Now, when we say coherent set, it means that a theory has things that have come together to become a, a, a collective. So a, 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 a theory is a coherent. It means that they have currency be, be behind, there's currency, there's currency between the, the general propositions or relationships that have been postulated. So a coherent set of general propositions which are used as principles of explanation, understanding and predicting apparent relationships of certain observed phenomena. Now, let me explain it very well. First of all, it means that before we can develop a theory, we shall, we shall have observed phenomena. We shall carry out some empirical observation of a social phenomena, and then we can be able to identify that there are some relationships that exist between some variables in this phenomena, and then we end up saying that this is the relationship. Then when we test it after some time and it is accepted by the scientific community that we belong to, then we can then say that we have a theory. So that theory then tells us that the theory, that, theory, that theory then becomes a postulation or general proposition or relationship that of something that, um, or, or how something works within a particular observed phenomenon. When we look at Lentine's bird, we are trying to say that we have observed that if we're able to get the area of a rectangle, a rectangular object. We have observed that to be able to get the area of a rectangular object, we are, can see that you have to multiply something called the length, which is usually the longer part, and another part called the, the breadth, or, or the width, which is usually the shorter part. When you multiply the two together, we get the area. So we have observed this relationship of the concerning this phenomenon, and then because of that, we theorize, or well, we can use this particular relationship of the observed phenomena to explain other objects, the area of other objects that have a rectangular shape. So we can use it to understand, we can use it to explain, or we can use it to predict. Please, I want to stop here and then ask a question and ask you that, do you understand this definition? Because if you understand this definition, I have problems explaining the rest of the things to you. So I'm, 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 you can unmute yourself and say that the deficiency prop, I do understand something, let me explain it again. Let me know. If you are understanding, then I can let me, then let me know. So do you understand it? <laughs> Reginald and Co, do you understand? Kweku from Pong, Katie, Juanita, Jojo, do you understand this definition? Before I proceed, okay. Uh, Daniel, under what circumstances does the theory become a law? <laughs> There's no, theories are not laws. <laughs> law is in a different type of this thing. Uh, uh, law talks about jurisdiction, so it has to have a place where the thing applies to. So law is very different from um, 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 uh, 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 of a theory, the theory. I don't want to talk about the law laws in science, but you let me stand here. Yeah, but. All of these levels of theorization become, a, become what, whatever they have to become as much as the scientific, um, what's the name, the scientific community accepts it. So there are some theories that I imagine the scientific communities have not yet accepted it. Okay, please, I don't see anybody raising a hand. Reginald, okay, Reginald, okay, do you have a question on that part? Um, it was a thumbs up, I, I get it. Okay, thank you very much, okay, good. So, theories, as Isaac was, um, as someone said earlier, theories can be empirically tested and verified, but they can be shown as a schematic diagram or a mathematical equation, or just a sentence. Yes, there's, no, there's no diagram, there's no mathematical equation, it's just a sentence. Okay, so now that you have that, for example, this is 
the theory of plan behavior. And it's a research framework at a theoretical state now. So I'm just, I'm just you don't worry about the word research framework. But this is the theory of plan behavior. The theory of plan behavior was developed by Ajahn out of different, different works, which we'll talk about later. Now, at the theory stage, now it's a theory of plan behavior. This is a theory of mathematics behavior, theory of plan behavior. So it's talking about a theorization of people's behavior, which is planned, intended, to understand the, the wording in the theory very well. Now, according to Ajahn, the theory of plan behavior depends on a number of variables or concepts. Ajahn says that to be able to de uh, determine somebody, uh, 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 the predict somebody's intended behavior or intention to perform a behavior is an influence of or it's a function of the attitude of the person towards the behavior, the subjective norms, the norms in society that subject the person to perform the behavior. And then there are certain relative perceived behavioral controls, controls which can control the person's intention to perform the behavior. And then when these things in, in, um, predict the intention, Intention does not mean that you perform the behavior. That one can then intention then can lead to the performance of the behavior. Now, but I can say that even though you have a favorable attitude when you assess, for example, now I'm applying. So now I'm now leaving the theoretical state to a conceptual state that I want to apply the theory of plan behavior to look at why students visit the Accra board, why they visit the as an intended behavior. Now, Students are likely to visit Accra more because it's, they have a favorable attitude towards them, that, that particular behavior. What do I mean by favorable attitude? They know that Accra more has sales going on. They know that Accra more has a, it's a place of hanging out. So you're social, so you may want to go there because of the fact that you may get certain benefits from that place or to buy something. So, you, and then you have heard that it's a place that has a um, a number of different shops that place in, put in one particular locality so they can get different things to be able to purchase. So it's of benefit to you. So that means that it gives you a favorable attitude because of the fact that you can see that it's of benefit to you. Now, another person can choose to go to a club mall because his friends are going there. Or today being, being a holiday, six March, a person can say that, oh, okay, I can see that this is a holiday. Everybody likes to go and hang out in a, a social environment where every, um, where a number of Ghanaians are hanging out. So I know my friends are going to the mall, so I, I want to go to the mall. So sometimes your social, your social um, networks can, can subject you to go to the mall. Another thing that could also happen is that in case you're a business person and you want to know the prices of products, you also sell maybe, you sell electronic parts or, or consumer electronics like TV and stuff. And you want to price your own. You may want to go to a car mall because of com competitive competition in the industry. You want to go and see how much that um, game sell the TVs, how much does Panasonic sell TVs, how much that this, this person sell uh, uh, tapes and stuff. So you want to go there to learn. So certain, certain competition in industry can even enforce you to go and perform a particular behavior or subject to your behavior. A behavior. So then some societal events can actually there's an event taking place, and then because of that, you are served by, by you are influenced by that to go to the to the mall. However, when we get to the mall, there are certain other in, in what we call situational impediments. You want assessment of situational your situational impediments or situational factors that can influence whether you enjoy being in the mall or the length of time that you stay in the mall. If you are a mother that has a child. You may go to the mall, but you won't and, and have a baby, a fresh and a new baby born. You may want to go and just get baby, baby food and leave the place because you don't want to stay, keep your baby walking around in the mall. So that can even become your own perceived behavioral control. It can subject you to leave the mall early. However, if a student is hanging out with his friends, whether the student will spend more time eating at maybe Barcelos at the mall or eating at maybe a Pizza Hut at the mall. What food he eats and what, whether how he enjoys himself then is dependent on his income or what disposable income he may have to spend at the mall. So disposable income can even influence a person in not spending more time on the mall or control his intention to spend more time on the mall or what he actually does at the mall. So that is why you see behavioral control being a factor, being an arrow coming there to, to behavior that itself. So even though the intention can be influenced by your income, 
your ability to actually perform and sustain the, be the behavior is also influenced by your behavioral control. This is what Ajahn is saying. Now, because it is a theory, I am applying to any intended behavior. That is how theories are. Theories are abstract in their state. So, so as far as I understand the theory, I can apply it to any social phenomenon which defines the theory. The theory says intended behavior, not com uh, um, behavior that comes under compulsion, intended behavior. So behavior that you, actually, you yourself have in, intended to go and do, or you are planning to go and do. So if you look at academic literature, this particular theory has been used to understand why some consumers like a particular uh, maybe bank and then they don't or banking product and they don't um, opt and they opt out of other banking products. It has also been used to help to understand preference of services, uh, behavior in the workplace. All of these particular theories have been used to be able to look examine so many many different uh, planned behavior in, in different scenarios and in different types of literature. Okay. Now there's a question here. Does it mean the theory you adopt must have a relation with the phenomenon you are studying? Of course. No, it has to be able to explain the phenomenon you are studying. Not necessarily a relationship being that it should be coming from if you are doing if you are in if you are in HR, it means that all your theory should come from HR. Not necessarily. You can actually pick a theory from maybe psychology and come and apply it to HR. Or pick a theory from mathematics and come apply it to HR. It's possible, depending on what the phenomenon you are studying. So, how do we know the proposed theory has been accepted by an academic community? Has it been, look at the publication, how many publications exist concerning it? And then when the maturity of the theory shows how far it has been extended, is extended using in the, in the academia. There are some theories that you can find only six papers on it. There are some frameworks that you may find only one paper on it. So it, these things happen. Okay. So we have, the, um, we, we have an understanding of what a, a research framework is. And then we have also been able to explain what um, could be in a, a, um, the, the the theory and then the, the dimensions of a theory in this particular scenario. So you see that within a theory, you have the constructs of the theory, intention, subjective norm, simple way control behavior. Then you have the relationship between the constructs. Attitude has a relationship with intention. Intention, subjective norm can influence intention. Perceivable control can influence intention and can also influence behavior. So you can see that happening here. Okay, so let me continue. Now, the theory of planned behavior was actually developed out of a theory of reason action, which was which postulated that a behavioral intention is a function of a person's attitude and a person's subjective norm. That was a mathematical equation. You can see it being written there. So sometimes theories can build upon other theories, which we do, we'll talk about later. Now let's look at the fact that the research framework can, exist as a, can start from a theory. Then it can also start from a conceptual state. A conceptual can st can st start from a literature review that turns into a conceptual model. So let's see how that one works. So this is a person doing a study on factors that contribute or cause unemployment. And in this particular scenario, the person has re read a different literature and then use it to develop um, a model here, a conceptual model here. And he's going to test it in his research work. And this is one of the things I would say that it can be based on the literature review. So this now is a research framework based on the literature review. It's not a theory. It's a research framework based on literature review. Now, this are suggested relationship of what influences unemployment, low wages, political instability, lack of startup capital, and high interest rates. The issue now is that after this has been tested for some time, and it gets to a point in which the postulation is accepted in the scientific community, and the person can then move to a level of a theory. But I'll explain what theories are and the concept, the building blocks of theories, and you understand how you can move from so somebody moves from a, a mo, um, just a model that he has for, um, postulated, and then it becomes a theory in future. So this one we have seen that coming from literature review. Okay. Now let's see another one. This is the student visit to the model, the Accra model, but it is based on the theory of plan behavior. So now the, what the student has done here is that he has now adapted it to the study and moved from the theoretical state to a conceptual state to use that as a framework. So he's saying that knowledge, he will measure, measure attitude towards the more by knowledge, knowledge about the more, peer influence as the subjective norm, and income as the perceived behavioral control. However, he introduced a now a new variable called trust. 
or perceived value, that even though a person has knowledge about the mall, his extent of trust about the mall can influence his intention. That's why he has another uh, uh, mediating variable here. Okay. Um, as is, I'll come back to you. So you see this particular uh, 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 model here, the, uh, or research framework here. You, you have the variables that by another one have been introduced. That's why it says modified from the chair of prime behavior. And the person then wants to use it to be able to study so, um, why students visit the, uh, the mall. So this concept, his phenomenon is about visiting the mall, students visit the mall. And then he has now taken the theory of prime behavior, which is an intended behavior theory. And then he applies it and then uses the variables that we can use to the measurable variables. He places them here. And then he puts in another variable in which he introduces another mediating variable here, which he calls the trust or perceived value. Now, somebody is asking a question that in the factor-based model, which of them um, is the dependent, which of them is the independent? So this one was just a postulation. I'm not saying this is coming from an existing study. So somebody conceptualizes. He thinks his outcome variable, which is the um, dependent variable, is, is unemployment. Because it's a factor that contributes or causes unemployment. So the outcome of the dependent variable, uh, dependent variable is unemployment. The independent ones are the ones that I receive here, low wages, political stability, lack of startup capital, high interest rates. Okay. So this is the student's um, research framework, and, and he has built it out of the theory of plan behavior. And he's calling conceptual framework on student visit to the mall. And it's modified from the theory of plan behavior. Okay. So conceptual frameworks are used as analytical schemes, like you saw earlier. They simplify reality to make it easier to discuss, analyze, or research on. They simplify reality by selecting certain um, uh, uh, variables and suggesting relationship between them. The question is that the suggestion of the relationship can either be theoretically based or based on a literature review. That's all what that's all what that uh, literature uh, um, conceptual frameworks are. Now, question is that somebody said, that, well, this is becoming pretty. You have conceptual framework, you've got uh, research framework, you've got theory framework. What I, what is all this that's going on? Everybody needs a research framework at least at the PhD or the master's level to carry out this research. The research framework can either be inspired by your theory or can be inspired by you reading the literature. Now, to be able to carry out the work, whatever you do is also a conceptual framework because you are conceptualizing or that this is what can occur. The research framework is just an encompassing term that talks about the fact that what framework frame your research. And then in trying to do that, you either develop it as from the theory side or you develop it from the literature review perspective. So at the end of the day, whatever research framework you have is also a conceptual framework. It conceptualizes how this particular phenomenon works or explains it or try to help us understand it at that point in time. That's all they're trying to say. Now, the, the issues that you have Okay, somebody said, when you add mediating variable, is it enough that is supported by Alicia? Yes, yes, it has to be enough that is supported by Alicia. You're right, um, being passer. Okay, so what we are trying to emphasize here is that the challenge many students have is they see these things or these words and they're th thrown around all the time. Research framework, theoretical framework, conceptual framework. What we need is your research framework. But we want to know as a PhD student or as an MPhil student, is your framework based on theory? That's where your theory, uh, uh, your theoretical foundations come in. Or is it based on just the literature review? That's all. But when you finish developing it, you can just call it a conceptual framework for looking at this issue or the research framework of this study. So the research framework is of the study. The conceptual framework is more about the issue. So the conceptual framework of this issue. So in a number, in a study, here, in one single study, you can have about three different conceptual frameworks. Or uh, one for question one, one for question two, one for question three. And they all come together to form the research framework of the study. In my PhD like this, I had about three or four conceptual frameworks, each of them looking at different, different questions that I had or objectives that I had. But when you put them together, I have the analytical scheme, which was my conceptual framework, my research framework for the entire study. So I just wanted to, exp I wanted to explain that. The conceptual framework is about the phenomenon, phenomenon you are studying, the phenomenon. So, and your phenomenon can have different parts. So your conceptual framework can be broken into different parts. However, 
your research framework is about all the things you have put together to ever frame the research. Please, do we understand this before I go on? Isaac, you can unmute and ask your question. Isaac, yeah. No, I don't have a question. Oh, sorry. I'm okay. Your hand was up. Sorry. Yeah, Reg yeah. I have to Reg now, Reg now, ask the question directly so that we can all hear. Reginald, ask the question directly. Okay, I don't think he hears me. Uh, so, okay. Prof, um, yeah, Reginald, Reginald first, Reginald first. Teresa, hold on. Okay, Reginald. Prof, um, what I'm asking is that um, the conceptual framework, is it likely to change at the end of the work? Because what I see, the age is more like the hypothesis. So what people are the individual, like the person doing the study on the okay, so, so hold on, hold on, hold on. I am um, Isaac asked this question earlier, maybe you didn't hear. We have the, the conceptual framework is what we are taking into the study. By the time we finish, we have the post-study framework. So that is the yeah, what? post-study framework. After you finish, what was the, the framework that, what came, what was, what was verified, what was tested, what stood in? Maybe you even get a better understanding and even cancel some of the things. So that is your prosthetic framework. Then future research will use your prosthetic framework. You understand me? Yeah. Good. But that is why it's important that it is based on proper literature and theory. So that it's not just anything that you have just conceptualized. Okay. Good. Somebody's asking, so such a framework is the same as a model. Please, I'll talk about levels of theorization later. I'm hoping that it's on my slide. If it's not on it, I'll open my, it's in the book. So I'll open um, the page of the book and we will discuss. I'm hoping it's, it's there. There's called, something called levels of theorization. I've mentioned it before, and I'll talk, I'll talk about that. Okay, so let's continue. I think we need to understand. We have a, we are, I'm happy that we all have some understanding now, so let's continue. Now, conceptual frameworks itself is just talking about relationships. So remember that the definition of conceptual framework was that it simplifies reality by suggesting relationships between them. So we need to know how do people do that simplification of reality? How do people do the simplification of reality? And if you understand it very well, you can understand how people then draw the schematic form of theories. That's what I'm trying to say. First of all, the, 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 the first type of um, um, relationship you are going to see in the conceptualization is what we call the cause and effect conceptualization. A cause and effect conceptualization is usually um, 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 a cause and effect framework or, uh, or diagram in which there are, direct, there are independent factors all leading to one dependent factor. So it's very, very simple. And this is one example. Independent factors come in. So a cause and effect. These are the causes of this effect. That's all. So sometimes in modeling your concept, concept you want to try to use a cause and effect approach. In which, listen very carefully, a cause and effect approach. Look at it, listen to the, what I said, cause and effect approach. It means that you have causes that lead into an effect. And your questions are, your thesis or your long essay would have been on what are the causes of that? What are the factors that predict this? What are the factors that influence something? So that means that the, the, what is being influenced then becomes the dependent. And what causes the influencing or the factor that comes into it then becomes the, factor, um, the, the depend, independent uh, factors. So the independent factors tend to influence or cause this thing to happen. And that is what becomes the dependent one. So for the dependent to happen, it depends on what? These independent factors that are sitting there on their own. I've not said that the dependent factors, the independent factors have got a relationship between them. All I'm just saying is the cause and effect. This is the first level. So please understand a cause and effect approach. Good. I can see that some we are all okay. So let's continue. Then you have the process approach. The process approach says that I don't think it's a cause and effect alone. But one thing causes something and then leads to another thing. So we can either draw it in a linear sense or in a cyclical sense. So in that sense, this is a cyclical model. Now this is called, in terms of framework, this is called the organizational learning cycle. The organizational learning cycle was developed by Dixon in, his, in, in her book, Nancy Dixon in her book on uh, um, organizational learning, in which she talked about the fact that the way people learn in organizations is by generating knowledge from or meanings from different, different diverse sources, integrating it, interpreting it, and acting on it. So for knowledge to be able to be, for organizations to learn, 
these four actions should happen generation integration and interpretation and action and, 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 and ability or the confidence or the opportunity to act upon it okay however now listen carefully however before nancy could develop this one there was a guy called McLean in her in his phd thesis developed something called the theory of meaning structures from his phd thesis so McLean explained that the theory of meaning structures say that in an organization to learn there are different different types of meanings there is a private meaning people hold it private knowledge they keep it they don't share with anybody then there is the collective meaning like minutes of a meeting things that the organization puts in the collective that everybody can discuss we can like the way we understand things in organization how they were codified some of them are codified as books in the organizational models of operandi now according to uh, mclean for you to be able to cause learning to happen people there should be accessible meanings that means that there should be activities in the organization that makes the private meanings people have confidence to share it or the collective meanings people is available for challenge so when you come to your office now i'm going to application on monday morning meetings monday morning meetings we like reflecting on the part what happened the previous week and we look at the coming week so we ask people to talk they are sharing their private meanings about what happened last week and then we look at what we wanted to do which is the collective meaning and we compare and then we shape it and then we then we all, all come to know that this is how we are going to work so the organization the ability to be able to move on belongs to depends on the accessibility of meanings in fact if you look at your learning learning in, at, at an individual level you are learning because i'm making knowledge accessible to you and i said that i'm making i'm making both my private meaning and i'm taking textbooks to show to you so i'm also taking collective meanings and showing it to you and then whilst you are learning and things you are also asking me questions so you are also sharing your private meanings about the issue but according to dixon when you put them together if you don't have their activities there that the accessibility that will not just happen so dixon went on beyond what mclean did to show that for the learning to take place there should be other social activities or certain, certain activities which are generation of the knowledge like how i said go, go online go and download something integrate ask yourself what did i see in the literature like i did tell you what theory did you see how did they use interpret it what did you see like what are the assignments i just gave you you are interpreting then i say act on it share what you have told me tell me what you have learned from it so i just did this thing to you right now generation integrating interpreting and action and because of that you have a better understanding about um, and what the framework is and what what a theory is and how it is used in academic purpose so this is the organizational learning cycle built upon the theory of meaning structures that is coming from martin's work so somebody can build from somebody's work but it's in a lean it's in a cyclical manner okay now let's continue again so now let's see the next one sorry 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 um, okay so the next one is the um, conceptual framework of the impact of mobile phones to micro trading. This is a phenomenal study, impact of mobile phones to micro trading. So I then developed this one from, as I mentioned earlier, from the theory of the transaction cost theory. And, the trans and, uh, and we applied it to, into commerce. And then we talked about the fact that even in the economics, you have stages of trading, doing trade, post trade, and um, pre trade, doing trade, and post trade. So what we see here is that a, a trader will adopt a phone and apply to these trading stages of trading and then to move on to the the different um, um, type of benefits and to lead to different types of impact so it's more of a, a linear approach a more of a linear approach in this scenario please i've seen your questions there i want to finish the different approaches of of, uh, of conceptual framework before we go to the literature i answer your questions so that i can take all the questions there then you have got hierarchical um, relationship which is very very from a, a lower to a higher position which is very very common i think the, the most dominant one is the um, maslow's hierarchy of needs and then um in maslow hierarchy of needs you have got a physiological being at the base goes to safety then goes to wow some people are now coming it goes to safety 
I'm recording this anyway. Same thing goes to belonging, it goes to self esteem, and it goes to self actualization. So you are going to be different, different levels. And at this different level, at each level, the person may have what motivates the person. So this is more about a chair of motivation. And people have different things that motivate them. So these are the different needs. And the needs are in a, in, in a hierarchy. So the highest one being the self actualization. So those of you who are in HR, you have read about this before. Okay. So you can see that in the theory, you can also have it in terms of, you can conceptualize in terms of hierarchies. Okay, then you also have those which are conceptualized in terms of maps and coordinates. Maps and coordinates. Maps and coordinates are based on, please, this kind of thing, I didn't develop it myself. I learned it from uh, Fisher's, Colin Fisher's book on writing and uh, researching on dissertation, an essential uh, guide for business students. I think there's a PDF available somewhere. We, we got it for the university. I'll try and get it. Get, get it to you. But it's, it's also in, um, well explained in, my, in, in our book that you have been reading. So map-based conceptual frameworks show concepts and how they are related to a vertical and horizontal scales of a map, or even in the two by two uh, 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 matrix or in a, a table. There are different models that come in different things. So you, sometimes you see people using even um, maps and coordinates to show different, different um, models. For example, um, Nonaka and Teki's model of uh, of um, um, organizational learning, which of the socialization, externalization, internalization, and then uh, combination is, is based on maps and coordinates. Those of you who know about it. I think Reginald, you know about that one. Nonaka, Nonaka and Tech, if you don't know about it, then you have to go back to HR. You are not studying, you have not read well. <laughs> okay, so this is supply and demand curve. This one everybody knows. And this has been there for a very long time. And it's also about maps and coordinates. I don't need to explain this further. Okay, then you also have got gap analysis. And the marketers know about this one a lot. Gap analysis comes from conceptual frameworks that expose gaps in the phenomenon or show a discrepancy in the phenomenon. One of them being the service quality model, which has been used in HR, marketing, uh, hospitality studies, um, health services management study, all to look at service quality. Now, even in information systems studies have been used for, 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 for a number of different studies. Now, it talks about the fact that um, service quality represents the discrepancy between a customer's expectation for a service offering and the customer's perception of the service received. So the, the respondents answer questions about the expectation and perceptions, and they use that one to be able to assess the difference in terms of um, the gap. So it's a multi-scale item. So this one may not be a diagram, it's a multi-skill item. So you, you can see that sometimes even a, a theorization can be shown in terms of a scale. But it just tells you about the gap. And it also talks about different contracts, tangibility of the quality, the, the, the service, the reliability of the service, responsiveness of the service, assurance of the service, and empathy of the service. These are different dimensions which you can also measure the, uh, the customer's perceptions or on. Okay. So building blocks of a theory. Let me um, pause here and ans answer the, all the questions that I can see here. Okay, if you have another question that you want me to answer directly, I can, okay. Okay. <clears throat> wow, right now, okay. That's social constructivist paradigm, which mainly underlines quantitative research design, which is not true. Social constructive paradigm does not underline quantitative research design. Qualitative research design is on its own. You, you bring your paradigm to it. So somebody can come. There's even a positivist, a positivist way of doing qualitative research, if you don't know. So don't say that a particular paradigm is tied. To, yeah, there is. There are positivist case studies. <laughs> okay, so let's continue. So I can come as a critical realist or a realist and come into um, to apply to qualitative research. Okay. So that there will be no need to identify a theory. No, 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 no. See, you are, you are looking at different interpretations. The way a constructivist uses a theory is different from the way a realist uses a theory. A constructivist is using a theory to, to really to understand phenomena, not to be able to predict it. So what you, let me explain something. When you read existing literature, when you are doing your literature review, don't you come across theory? So you are constructivist. As soon as you see somebody's story in this work, you read it. You need to read it. You read it to be able to build your knowledge so that when you're going to the field, you can be informed by whatever you have read. So the, the, but a realist and um, a positivist read it with a different perspective, try to understand 
what existing relationship and what exists between the relations so that I can postulate them before it goes to the field. But the, the social, the constructivist or interpretivist is not doing it for that purpose. So if you pick an interpretivist case, a, a thesis or long essay, you will still see theory in the, you see some theories in the theoretical foundation. They are the foundations of its concept, of its understanding. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So it is forming your understanding. It's not saying that you are tied to it. Because in you, in, with the constructivist, even the theorization emerges as you're doing the work. I, have a, I, I know some of my students who are doing, using um, interpretive, and they have changed their theory about six times. But that you may not see that one happening much in a, a positivist and much in a, a realistic work. You would have done a very thorough study to be able to identify specific ones and carry that one throughout the study. Okay, could it be that the rationale for choosing theories in research, depending on research design one adopts, often based on a particular research paradigm, might be exclusively be purposes for testing theory for quantitative and for explanatory purposes for qualitative? Yeah, it's yes and no. Um, many qu quantitative would be that, so they like to test the theories and to predict, or predict phenomena. Qualitative would like to describe phenomena and then um, we'll try to explain phenomena. So it could be, you should know the purpose in which you're carrying out the study. And even the type of study you're carrying out, if you're trying to do causality, then your, your mind is going to things to trying to explain why something occurs. And you have to define causal factors. Your objective will then be looking at the theory in the causal perspective. Okay. Finally, understanding that there is a need to explain why a particular theory has been used in research Will one be falling short of the scientific principles of research? Should he or not use the theory mainly because of the researcher is adopting a social constructive worldview? No, 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 no. I think you should also know that the, the theories are selected by the is fit to explain the phenomenon, not what a theory is. A, a set of current propositions which are used as principles what, of explaining, understanding, and predicting uh, a certain uh, apparent relationship of, uh, concerning certain observed phenomena. So the theory is becoming our basis of understanding. Our, so if you are doing your study to understand, you will, your theory is basis of understanding. If your theory, if your, your work is to try to predict or test, your theory is the basis of theory, um, 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 predicting and testing. If your theory, your, uh, your, uh, your study seems to describe, your theory then becomes the basis for describing. So not what a theory does. That's why I gave you the definition of theory early. Principles, coherent set of principles which are used for understanding, eh, explaining, and predicting social phenomena. So you should know what you are using the theory for. If you are predicting and then testing, then you may be thinking about being a more of a positivist dimension or realist dimension or critical realist dimension. Can you, can you address each research question with a conceptual framework and combine the conceptual framework based on a number of research questions to form a a research framework, yes, please. Now, today we are asking very, very intelligent questions that are throwing me, uh, coming up, making the session very interesting. So, Dale, please, can you all rename your names to your actual names and index numbers so that I can know who and who has been coming online? Because sometimes it's very difficult. I'm calling somebody Dale, iPhone 2, iPhone 3. It's, there's no name with iPhone 2 and Dale. So please rename your thing so that when you ask the question, like that Lord Michael, my uh, Lord Michael W. But 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 your as which is full name Reginald Alpha as which is full name. Okay, so now let me let me illustrate this before I go on. Let me illustrate this thing before I go because I know a lot of you are asking me questions on this issue. Um, 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 Can you address this coming from Eleanor? Hello, Paul. I said, where we, where we do, when, when, when we name it. I don't know. I do. I, all I know is, 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 is um, a name that you have mentioned there, but I beg you, please rename it. Okay, so I'm going to try to show you a question that Elena and then um, this guy has asked at the same time. Michael, uh, um, Isaac asked the same question earlier, and I was explaining it. Okay. So, um,
Okay, so let me just give me a second. I'm trying to share my screen with you. I'm going to show, share something with you on my screen that will help you understand what I'm talking about. Um, okay. Okay. Ouch. Okay, so. Um, okay, so let me just do a new share and share something with you. So what you are seeing right now is my PAD chapter four. I want to show you something. So the type, the chapter four is, this is where I developed my research framework. And I also put, uh, this is where I developed my research framework. I developed different conceptual frameworks throughout the world, but this is where I developed my research framework. I brought all of them together. So look at something that's happening here. Okay, so um, let's continue. So this is my PAD. As I go down, I go down, I'm using the resource-based theory. So as I start explaining, this look at figure 4.1, I'm explaining the relationship between resources and firm performance. And I go on, I also have another figure here, which is about the resource-based model of organizational performance. Then I continue, and then I start um, building another one, the resource-based view of a model of e-commerce benefits. Then, a typology of resources that support, this is a table, but it's also a framework, a table of resources that support e-commerce adoption in the firms. And then capability, figure 4.4, capability or resource development life cycle. Now look at my research framework. So look at, what, look at the title, conceptual framework and research proposition. This is my research framework. So my research framework says that I have four questions. One is what are the input for um, uh, to, what resources are used by Ghanaian firms in e-commerce in Ghana? Another one, what processes they put together? What is the outcome of e-commerce and what is the impact of e-commerce? Now look, if I want to solve the input question, I need the model called figure 4.3 and table 4.1. If I want to solve the process question, I need the figure 4.4, which is another more, um, uh, uh, more um, conceptual uh, uh, research, research um, theoretical model there. It's based on somebody's theory. Then the outcome. If I want to look at the outcome or the capabilities in e-commerce, look at table 2.1. If I look at, look at the impact, you see figure 4.3. Okay. Now all of these frameworks are within the national context. So I put them within the nation. So they say the nation, the national context can inform what is happening there. So what you see here right now is a, a, a research framework, which is a combination of different conceptual frameworks which have been put there. So this then become my analytical frame for the whole thesis. So if I have question one, you see the type of conceptual model I use, question two, question three, question four. I am not saying that go and develop different conceptual model for each question. It depends, somebody can have one there are, some, there are some questions in the thesis that will not have a conceptual model. That's, it happens like that. Like, what is happening in this area? What is the nature of something? So you may not have it. You just describe what is happening. So in that, then when he talks about why does something happen, then you may have a model for it. So please note what I'm just, I'm just showing this as an example for you. Okay. Okay, given the structure of a research paper from the course outline, we have a literature review where we aspire to define the issues under the study, theoretical foundations, and then conceptual framework. Can I bring the definitions under the conceptual framework? No, there's nothing like definitions. <laughs> literature review is literature review. Literature review means that you have to actually conduct a literature review of the literature. Okay, so you review the literature to be able to point out what has been done and what has not been done. Okay, so I don't know, I don't know whether you are supposed to actually write a research paper. Okay, I'll, I'll look at it again. But what I'm trying to say that literature review is much more of a literature review of what you're supposed to do, or, or, or the phenomenon that you're supposed to carry out. So that's different. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so I've answered this one. I've answered this one. Okay. Good. So let's let's uh, let's continue back to where, where we're studying. I hope I've answered everybody's question. If I have a question, before I move on, if I have a question, please unmute yourself and ask. And let me move on, then I can move on quickly. If you have a question, please unmute yourself and ask. So we are going to build in blocks of a theory. That means that uh, if I take it, um, Isaac, you are okay. Reginald, you are okay. Jojo, you are okay. Casey, you are okay. Victoria, you are okay. Wakefield, you are okay. William, Yvonne. Yvonne, today you are very, very quiet. Let me hear your voice. Okay. Good. So building blocks of a theory. We've got some weight, much to do now. So we mentioned that a theory is a coherent set of general propositions which are used as principles of understanding, explaining, and predicting apparent relationships in certain observed phenomena. To continue, I just want to give you another definition of theory. A theory is an organized, coherent, and systematic articulation of a set of issues that are communicated as a meaningful whole. Theories explain, hold on please. Theories explain, theories provide complex and comprehensive conceptual understanding of things that cannot be pinned down, like how societies work, organizations operate, and why people interact in specific ways. And that's what we actually saw. They try to bring different, uh, bring different, different things together to explain a social phenomena. Okay. Now, theories are helpful in designing a research question, selecting the guide, the selection of relevant data, interpret the data, and explain proposed explanations of causes of influences. Now, let me explain something here about theories help to design a research question. You see, most of the time, students just develop their research questions without looking at the theory, and they finish, and they come back, and they try to link the research question to the theory. There are certain thesis approaches or long essay approaches in which people you could let the theory rather define the research question. You have the area you choose your theory, and then because you are using that theory as the only theory for your work, you can say that okay. Because this theory is the fundamental part of the work, my research questions will be tied to the theory. Somebody is saying that, bro, we don't understand. So let me give you an example. So I'm going to just give you an example here. Um, okay, so. What I'm going to show you right now is my master's thesis from University of Manchester. I just want to show you something. This is a good thesis. We got an, a good mark. Okay. So now look at it. Um, I'm going to zoom into my my research question for you to see something. Okay. Now I'm, this is this theory is about organizational learning. So look at what it says. So look at the research questions to address. Okay, to address these issues, this research seeks to answer the question. This research seeks to answer the question, how can organizations learn and transfer knowledge gain doing information system development projects within organizations? Organizational learning in this research is viewed from the perspective of making knowledge accessible for action and draws on the theory of many structures in organizations by McLean 1983. Dixon's 1994 organizational learning cycle based on the theory forms the theoretical framework or the theoretical understanding, thus generating the following sub-questions. Within information system development, how can information be widely generated? How can information be integrated? How can information be collectively interpreted? How can action 
be responsibly defined. These four questions are coming from the theory. I showed you the theory earlier, organizational learning cycle. Then the last one is my own addition. How can the culture of learning be created to facilitate continuous learning and contribute to the success for your success? I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So what I've done here is to show you how a theory can actually inform a research, a research question. I'm not saying this is a must. I'm just showing that it helps if you can actually link the two together. It helps if you can link the two together. It helps. Okay. So now you have had an idea and understand. Please, if you have any question, stop and ask me the question. I, I, we learn better when you ask questions. Otherwise, I'll continue. Okay. So now let's continue back. To, let's go back to our teaching. Okay. Um, okay. There's no question. So let's go back. Everybody, you are welcome. Okay. So. Um, Building blocks of a theory. So what, what are the concepts of, what are the building blocks of a theory? First of all, constructs. Constructs are abstract, abstract concepts specified at high level of abstraction, abstraction that are chosen to specifically explain a, social, a phenomenon of interest. It means that when we are doing, um, um, uh, looking at the theory, there are constructs of the theory. Those variables that, those um, um, concepts that we actually try to measure within the theory. We call them the constructs of the theory. Then you, you also have then we also have propositions. Propositions are the relationship between the constructs. The quantitative people call it hypothesis. The qualitative people call it propositions. Okay. And then logic. The logic means that why does the theory exist? Why does the theory exist? What does it seek to do? For example, the logic of the A, um, of L times B is the area that is trying to determine. So the logic means that the, if you are looking for the area of the, the logic of uh, the area of a rectangle says that if you want the area of the rectangle, you have to multiply L times B. That's the relationship of the propositions. And the constructs are the constructs are the L times B. But the logic says that it is the multiplication of the two that gives you the area. So the, the logic tells us the glue that connects the theoretical constructs and provides meaning and relevance. It's area, it's not volume. It's area we're looking for, it's not volume. So the area just is about L times B. When it comes together, it forms the area. Assumptions are, all theories have got assumptions, that's the fourth one, and they've got boundary conditions. Assumptions are values, time, and space. For example, the L times B assumes that what you are going to apply to is a rectangle, but your land is not always a rectangle. Your land has got different, different, depending on the topography of your land, your land can be more than the, uh, and then the, the way the cut, the, the land is lays, it's lays out. Your, your land can even be more than the L times B or less than the L times B. So it can be more or less than the theoretical area that you have. Okay, so it's an assumption about the value time and space. The boundary conventions are where you can apply it. It means that if I'm looking, if, if my, if my, Land is shaped like a rectangle, I, a, a triangle. I can't use the rectangular area to be able to get the area of the plate, the, the, the rectangular formula to be able to get the area of that particular rectangular piece of land. So if my land is in a trapezoid manner, I need to be able to use a trapezoid formula or formula to be able to get the area of my land. It means that there are boundaries, it means that that's where a theory can be applied and where a theory cannot be applied. Some theories can be applied in one, say, one particular phenomenon. It can't be applied in another, another type of phenomenon. So you have to know the boundaries of a, the boundary conditions of every theory that you are using. And you should know the assumptions of the theory. Okay. Now, how are theories generated? Let me look at the question. What if you are working on a fairly new area um, and uh, climate change and there is no theory relating to what you are doing? How do you still come up with a framework. <laughs> uh, climate change is a concept, but what about climate change are you trying to study? It's a phenomenon, but what about it? If you're going to look for mitigation and you're looking at a social behavior, there will be social theories there. If you're looking, if it's in science, there'll be some scientific understanding there. Always, I emphasize that there is nothing like the area is new and there's nothing there before. There is always an existing knowledge in the bigger conceptualization of the area. For example, 
Unemployment belongs to employment literature. Female unemployment belongs to employment literature. So climate change, it belongs to a type of literature, whether in geography, whether in, um, 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 even in, in, uh, in, in social science, there's a type of um, literature it may belong to. In that type of literature it belongs to, there is, there is a theory that you can be able to use to be able to lend understanding in the area. Sometimes you have to develop a combination. Now let me explain another thing to you here. Um, regional. Somebody is studying climate change, but what is he studying? If he's studying about social behavior towards climate change uh, uh, um, advice, it's social behavior you are studying. So your social behavior theories can apply. So you have to know that sometimes the theory will not come from the phenomenon. It will come from the aspect of the phenomenon you are studying. The aspect. Or it may not come from the general domain area. I'm doing a study on consumer behavior. But my, but my, my study could be on my study could be on, um, let's say, uh, um, um, uh, consumer behavior on in impact of technology on consumer behavior. And I'll go and draw technology literature and theory from technology literature to, to study it. Because I could argue that all existing studies on consumer behavior have been using social theories. It is important that we now use a, a, a technical theory, that, um, a theory from uh, 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 technology um, information systems to uh, look at the issue. In that case, I may draw from information systems instead of drawing from consumer behavior literature. Okay. Um, proving, prof, does it mean that we have, we have been approached? We, we have approached research all this while with, the way we have approached research all this have been problematic. If not, the cause of our poor understanding of good research work. But our, our boundary condition the same as what predicts the modulating variables. No. Boundary conditions is boundary condition. What, how you can apply it and where you can apply it at. You should know the boundary conditions of a theory. For example, some theories are bounded to a particular level. The theory explains how individuals react to an issue. The theory of planned behavior is an individual planned behavior. It's not an, uh, an organizational planned behavior. It is not um, a nation's planned behavior, but it's an individual. So theory of planned behavior can explain individual employees Managers, individual, not the organization. Unless you are conceptualizing, conceptualizing organization as a collect, um, as a collection of individuals together as one. But the the theories act at different levels, so you should know what levels that they are acting, which is also part of the boundaries. Okay, let's talk about how theories are generated. Teresa, mm -hmm. okay, please. If you are finding a theory to in a different field of work you are doing, you still have to still search. So I guess you months. I know somebody who, it took the person about seven months to get a particular theory, to look at one dimension of the issue. We had one theory from her own discipline, which was several, several one question, but the other, which was coming from the, 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 the multidisciplinary work, the other theory, you had to go on and do more reading, you have to identify it. So it takes, it takes time. It takes time and you have to read more literature. Okay, how are theories generated? Theories are generated from different perspectives. One, approach one, build theories inductively based on observed patterns and behavior. Usually this is one we call, we call the grounded theory building approach. It means that somebody looks at the data and out of the data looks for relationships and out of, and out of the relationships, they are seeing the data, it theorizes. So some theories are built out of data. Just the data, just looking at the patterns or collect quite a number of data and then look at the relationship that happened between the, um, the patterns of the occurrence in the data and out of, out of that theorize, it happens. Now, up, then you have approach two. Approach two, use a bottom-up conceptual analysis of different set of predictors potentially relevant to a target phenomenon using a predefined framework. So somebody then will say that, okay, um, I didn't find a theory. So I went to the literature and I read my own things and I came up with this model, and I'm going to tell whether the model exists. So he puts certain things together, this variable leads to this variable, leads to this variable. And after that, he, he postulates that this is what could work. He goes to the field and tests it, and it, it comes out of, oh, one of them drops out and the rest stay. It looks like this is the, the theory of looking at this issue. Then he tests it in different environments and different contexts and see that it seems to be, it seems to be the same. And out of that, he has developed his own theory. So what he did is that he, he came up with a predefined framework 
and then want to collect data on it and use that one to be able to refine it. So that's why I say it relies heavily on the inductive capabilities of the researcher. He, he first of all defines the, the uh, a predefined framework and then take that framework to, to the field and uses that one to be able to do a research and, and then refines it. Okay. So bottom up conceptual analysis, different sets of predictors potentially relevant to the target phenomenon using a predefined framework. This is also an inductive approach that may be based on empirical investigations. Okay. Now the second part of the, the explanation is that sometimes somebody too can also look at the existing data, come up with some particular framework of it, and then use that one to theorize. It, that's building on from like the approach one. But all of this is, is all depending on the knowledge that you know. So in case I'm studying uh, the behavior of, 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 let's say, migrants in new localities, and I say I want to use the theory of plant behavior as my base understanding, but then I go on, based on the theory of plant behavior, I, put, I, I come up with a model, a conceptual framework, take it to the field, and I see different patterns, and I use those patterns to money, help enrich it. I could end up developing my own theory. The other approach is that I could also go into the field and as I'm looking at the data in the field, I'm actually using the theories that I know in my mind to be able to examine the field. So I may, I may, I'll be looking at the data and say, okay, this may be linking to this. Okay, it's actually, this is a pattern I'm, I'm seeing. This pattern seems to be related to the theory of plant behavior, but I can draw it this particular way. And I'm seeing the other variables coming in. And out of that, I will develop it. Now, it's very difficult to say that, um, I'll, I'll explain something later. Most of these approaches I'm explaining, it's a combination of them that come together to develop the theory. It's not like they are all standing on their own, apart from approach one. You let me explain approach two and three, three and four. Approach three, extend or modify a theory. So for example, extend and modify an existing theory to explain a new, in a new context by extending choice of individual learning to, such as extending choice of in, individual learning to organizational learning, like what we, what we did earlier. So somebody, knows that this is a theory of meaning structures, and then he applies it to looking at how people learn in the organization. So Dixon, for example, took the work of McLean and applied it to the organizational context by looking at, at the organizational level, how people learn. But Dixon's work began from McLean. McLean's work was more about learning at the individual level. But then McLean, after explaining her own, then after explaining the theory of meaning structures, Dixon came to pick it up and then as we moved it to the organizational level and applied it and used it to gain, gain, gain added, added, added other variables to it in terms of the steps, generation, integration, uh, integration, interpreting and acting as other dimensions of activities to let learning occur. So he took, he took an existing theory and modified. Now the last one has to do with you apply existing theories in a different context. So something has been done in a one developing country. Let's say you are studying a phenomenon like expatriate behavior in Russia. Then you go to another European country like, uh, let's say, um, Denmark, and then go and do the same, say a similar study on expat expatriate behavior in Denmark. So what you are doing here is that you are applying existing theories in an entirely new context by drawing on the structural similarities between the context. This approach relies on reasoning by analogy and is probably a most creative way of theorizing using a deductive approach. Now, what you end up doing here is that you are going to then tell us that by the time you finish, is the theories the same irrespective of A or B? Or does the theory change as we go into, even though the context is the same, does the theory change as we go into a similar context? But what are the variables that is causing the theory to change? So you can modify and enhance the theory by ending up applying the same theory in a, in a, in a different community or different context, which share similar similarities with the previous one. So the first one, you, do, you, you take the data and learn from the data. The second one, you take um, you have a predefined framework and take to the field and then test it. 
and then use, uh, use the data you took from the field to refine it or to make it better. The third one, you take an existing theory and extend it to a different, uh, um, uh, a different, a different issue. So at one level, it was, the term was used to explain um, a phenomenon A, and you take it to a different phenomenon which can be applicable to, it can be applicable to, but in order to develop a new theory for that new phenomenon you are studying. The fourth one, you take your studying phenomenon A in context B, then you go and study the same phenomenon A in con context C to be able to develop a theory based on what you have been able to find, which will be applicable to context C. So by the time you finish, you'll be able to even enhance and, and give better feedback on the same theory that you, are, you, you picked up from context B. So please look at a different one. A combination of all of these is what is used in the work that we do. Now, how are theory generated? So let's take an example. This is a theory of um, the technology acceptance model. Now, it, the technology acceptance model was developed by Davis in 1989. And it talked about the fact that the intention to use a technology is actually influenced by two things, perceived usefulness of the technology and then perceived ease of use of the technology. So Davis came up with this particular model to be able to explain why people end up using a particular or adopting a particular technology. So you have seen how Davis came up with it. So perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use then influences the intention to use. So I took that particular model and then I applied it to my work. So I applied it to a paper I wrote in, on mo a mobile commerce adoption and use it by traders. So in that particular model, I looked at why do people adopt mobile phones? You see that's in the middle here. And I said that the perceived usefulness can influence that. But the perceived usefulness is also influenced by uh, um, the perceived ease of use. So you can see that one coming to perceived usefulness. But I didn't draw an arrow from ease of use to adoption. So I said that ease, ease of use influences usefulness, which is partly in the literature, and then can influence adoption. Then I also said that, okay, when somebody adopts, when he gets, begins to use it, he can use it for pre-trade, during trade and post-trade. But that kind of usage, the outcome can end up leading to impact. The impact will be, it enhances the communication, enhance trading processes and reform structure processes. Can go back and re-emphasize re the perceived usefulness. So the more you use it and get favorable results, the better your, your perceived usefulness about that particular technology enhances or increases. However, I also said that outside to the organization or uh, the, the, the adopter is the readiness of the external environment, whether accessibility and affordability. I think this is one of them supposed to be affordability. But accessibility to the technology can influence the readiness to use the particular technology, affordability of the technology, the accessibility to the technology. So if, you, if the technology is not accessible in a particular context, it can con, con, constrain the ability for us to see perceived usefulness out of it. So especially if you are using a mobile phone in an area that the mobile network doesn't work, you can't be able to even get any benefit to it. And I also argue that the adopter's knowledge of mobile phones can influence his level of ease of use of the technology, of the technology and then perceive usefulness. The more savvy you are, the better understanding you have about the, the easy, a better um, likelihood you have an easier understanding of using the technology or a better understanding of using the technology that you want to use. So this is coming from the theory and um, the technology acceptance model. Okay. So now let's continue. Now, attributes of a good theory. Every good theory has a number of things in it. One of them is logical consistency, meaning that at the logical, theoretical constructs, that's the propositions, the the, the building blocks, the boundary conditions and assumptions, logically consistent to each other. If some of these building blocks are not consistent to each other, that, um, that means that a theory assumes rationality, but some constructs represent non-rational concepts. The theory is a poor theory. So that means that if it doesn't make sense, if the, if the relationship does not um, uh, um, pan out well, or there doesn't seem to be a relationship between the two, and it looks like it cannot even, what, that, what you are saying, it predicts something, cannot even be possible, that means that it cannot hold. For example, another example could be the um, another example could be the extent of application. For you, 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 are, you are looking at a theory that 
let me just use an example that is more interesting and easier for us to look at. Okay, so um, in uh, medical science, we have got something we call the five stages of grief. That talks about the different stages a person goes through to grief. Then you are, you are going to develop uh, the stages of grief and you are, you are trying to apply it to the nation. It doesn't apply to the nation, it applies to an individual. So a nation doesn't go to a that particular five stages of grief. If you want to postulate one for the nation, then you have to study different nations and how they handle grief. But this one was based on somebody studying a particular individual. Doesn't mean that some of the concepts may not apply. But what you're trying to emphasize here, a nation is not, is not an individual. So we have to make sure that the boundary conditions are consistent with each other. They're consistent with each other. Number two, the explanatory power, how much does a given theory explain or predict the reality? Good theories obviously explain the target phenomenon better than rival theories. This is very important, especially when you are developing your conceptual framework. You have to make sure that whatever you are trying to postulate can explain the concepts as you are, as you are seeing them. Sometimes some students just put arrows together and they say they explain something, but they may not be explaining anything. We expect that whatever you are doing, there should it should be able to explain the phenomenon. When I showed you my conceptual framework earlier on mobiles and market mobiles and, um, and market uh, and micro trading you could see that there was an understanding for each of the faces or each of the questions i had how traders what traders do in trading the benefits you get and the impact so there were explanations for each of them and there were the, the conceptual model tried to address each each of each of the issues that you, you could see there okay now let's see let's see an, ex an example of what i was just trying to say hmm. Now, you are saying that this particular model is saying that the factor that um, predicts unemployment, he says high interest rate, political instability, and lack of startup capital. Now, these variables are all acting at different, different levels. Lack of startup, startup capital is acting at the, at the level of a firm. High interest rates can, can act at the level of the firm or industry. Political instability is a, it's acting at the level of the nation, macro level. So there's logical inconsistency in this postulation the student has. He's saying that political instability, high interest rates, and lack of startup capital influence unemployment, but they are all coming together in one model. And it looks like they are, uh, 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 the, this particular one model, this particular one model is trying to say that they all predict unemployment. Yes, they can individually predict unemployment, but they are they putting them in one model you have to be very careful because there's not some consistency in because they are all acting at different levels. So when you are measuring them and you're asking questions, they will be asking them at different, different levels. It will be better for you to look at the national level factors and then look at the, um, the firm level factors and then maybe the industry level factors at different, different, and group them different, differently. So they can explain that these are the national level factors, these are the firm level factors, and these are the individual level factors. Putting them together in just one model without showing the different levels that they operate, it can it, it can affect some some it can affect our understanding of how they work and how you are going to even measure the relationships. Okay, and at, at the question is that who are, who is answering this particular question? Is it at the, at, at, is there an individual answering the question about what influence unemployment or it is the perception of industry players or the perception of policy makers? Who is who is this particular question, the particular model address, so is it an individual, is it a, a firm, or is it the nation, or is it an industry? Who is it addressed to? So that there's logical inconsistency within, in terms of the levels, in terms of the variables, and their postulation at different, different levels. How would you even measure political instability? What is your measurement for political instability? And there are different forms of political instability, and a different conceptualization about it. Which of them are you referring to? So these are some of the issues that come in just pull, throwing down variables and just drawing arrows and see that it makes sense. Okay. So now the another issue is that that political, now look at explanatory power. That political instability just get up and then lead to unemployment. Political instability has to cause certain things to happen in, a, in the industry. For example, a political instability will affect confidence of people which can even let, um, uh, banks stop giving uh, loans at all, or, or the loans will become at high risk, which could actually also lead to certain things and lead to unemployment. 
So political instability does not just get up and lead to unemployment. It goes through different phases. So there could be other variables that you are missing. This is even a process model now. So and, and initially, just saying the political instability just lead to unemployment means that you are actually collapsing all these other variables. That it that um, that may it that could actually better explain how political instability leads to unemployment. But because of the fact that you are just drawing arrows, you couldn't see that there, there could be other sub variables or there could be other related variables that come together to make political instability lead to unemployment. So these are the things that I'm emphasizing on, uh, on logical consistency and explanatory power. Another set of attributes of a good theory. Now, every theory should, be, should have some degree of falsification. It should, it should, have, it should be forcible. Uh, Forcibila, forcibility, forcibility. That means that there should be degree to which it can be um, tested whether it is possible or, or it, it, is, it, is, it is disprovable. The reason why we say that is that whenever you're carrying out research, you should actually check that the theory that you use can it be challenged. If empirical data does not match with the theoretical proposition, which allows for empirical testing by other researchers, because we are talking about science, science lies. You see, the the interesting thing about science is that accuracy lies in the ability of testing uh, the ability of testing the postulation that we are put in science. So, if we want to say that this thing occurred, then we should have been able to test it. And the only way we can test it is be able to have enough information. And in that, the understanding of the variables, understanding of the postulated relationship, so that we can test it. So, if your theories, in other words, cannot be can, cannot be theories unless they are empirically testable. If we cannot test it, if we cannot be able to develop measures for it, so that we can test them in the real world, then we can't have a theory. Like I mentioned earlier, I just mentioned political instability leading to unemployment, and I mentioned the other ones. How are you going to test it? In what form were you going to put the variables in, so that we can become testable? So. A theory should be has the potential of being disproved so that others can be able to challenge it. And there are other reasons why people's uh, postulation by people have not turned, uh, some other researchers or even some even um, um, other academics have not turned into a theory that the model that they have, put, they have drawn out there, it's not testable. I remember there was a time that I developed a particular model in a particular um, work I was doing and the, a reviewer told me that what you have done is not testable. It's not possible for future research to use it. So can you simplify the, the theory, in the, the, your, 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 your model, in a manner that other, others can be able to apply it and the understanding can be can easier to, for others to be able to work, use it in their future research. Now, we also said, and that takes us to parsimonity. Now, we actually said that every theory should be parsimonious. Parsimonious means that we should use simple, a, 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 a fewer variables or fewer assumptions to be able to explain complex issues. Parsimonial theories have higher degrees of freedom, which allow them to be easily generalized to other contexts. That's what our settings and population. That means that he's using fewer variables to be able to explain a complex phenomenon. If you use too many things to be able to explain, explain a complex phenomenon, that means that if there are too many variables at play and then there are too many assumptions at play, that makes it very difficult for others to be able to test your theory. So we are saying we are saying that whenever you are postulating a theory, or to be able, or you are postulating suggesting a model that you want to test, that in future others can be able to use in their research. Try to make sure that the thing is as simple as possible. That there are fewer number of variables to be able to explain a complex phenomenon. Okay. Now don't ask me that how many variables make it fewer. It's more about how how the understanding is is um, outlined within the particular. Uh, model or theoretical frame that you have. So if you are suggesting a particular relationship and you are having so many relationships flowing over the place, it's very, very difficult for people to test it and maybe apply it in their future work. It's not, I'm not saying that you cannot have more than 20 hypotheses in a particular model. It's possible. It's possible. Especially if you are looking at multidimensional variables. But what we are trying to emphasize here is that as much as possible, be parsimonious in your development of a theory. L times B is very, very simple. Half base times height is very, very simple. So these are some of the things I'm just drawing your mind to. Okay, so the time value of theories. Hmm. It's not easy. Time value of theories. So theories go to different, different stages and as they go to different, different stages, they get modified and they get modified, they get, they get enhanced and they get changed. 
So I'm going to try to use one to demonstrate that. So in 1975, Martin Fishburne and Isaac Agen came up with a model called the theory of planned behavior, the theory of reason action. And they said that a person's reason action is informed by attitude towards the behavior and the subjective norm. And they say that that influenced the person's behavior, intention to perform the behavior and the actual performance of the behavior. This was accepted and it was used. However, Ajahn himself came back 10 years after and then said that, and then said that, mm, I've been using this for some time now, but I don't think that there's another variable if the thing is the behavior is planned, not to, the other one was theory of reason action. Now we are talking about theory of plan behavior. So he said that to look at plan behavior, sometimes there are not dimensions that's perceived behavior control. That's a, the, an individual assessment of situational impediments that could influence the perform, performance of the behavior at the individual level. And that is what you call the perceived behavior control. Hence, I then added that to a particular variable and then developed the theory of plan behavior, building from the theory of reason action. Okay. Then later on, people like Taylor and Todd started expanding upon the theory of um, plan behavior and said that when the guy told us that attitude, subjective non specific control, he didn't tell us what goes into it, but there are different, different explanations that exist here. So if you look at this particular part, we are seeing all these parts that you have here. Um, let me just use a, a highlighter to. Um, okay. Okay. So if you look at this particular, um, okay. If you look at this one, up to here, what you have here is that you are seeing the theory of plan behavior, but he decomposed it. So he called, he called it the decomposed theory of plan behavior. The decomposed theory of plan behavior then tells you the sub variables that go into each of the dimensions of plan behavior. So he said that attitude can be measured by perceived usefulness, perceived ease of use and compatibility. Perceived ease of use and perceived usefulness is coming from where? It's coming from um, the theory of technology acceptance model, if you realize that. Compatibility is coming from Diffusion of innovation. Then you have got peer influence and superior influence going to subjective norm. Then perceived behavior control, he had self efficacy, resource facilitating conditions, and technology facilitating conditions, all of them coming together. So then this one becomes the, after 10, you see, after 10 years again, after 10 years of using the, the, the theory, somebody came up with this particular model. So that is Taylor and, and, and Todd. Okay, so let's continue. Taylor and Todd came up with this model. Now, Taylor and Todd's model was now applied in other studies. So this, this is another study that's using Taylor and Todd model. He's looking at e-filing behavior. People doing e-filing of taxes. So if somebody said e-filing attitude will be uh, if e-filing, if, if oh sorry, e-filing attitude will be actually uh, defined by perceived ease of use, perceived usefulness, and perceived risk, and perceived playfulness of the platform. Then personal in, interpersonal influence and external influence will be the subjective norm. Then internet self-efficacy, perceived controllability, and perceived resources will be at the perceived behavioral control. So this is somebody else using it in a different study, but he has also changed what are the components of the attitude, the subjective norms, and then perceived behavioral control. Okay. So now we have seen how it has come from theory of plan behavior to this particular one. Now look at another one. Okay, so this is coming from a recent use of theory of plan behavior. Coming was used by um, Henker and Fenko. And Henker and Fenko talked about this number of things, um, this particular model. Brown Love, he, he used, his paper was using the theory of plan behavior to understand Brown Love. And, and said Brown Love leads to forgiveness, where people tend to forgive a brand when they do something wrong. Now he's saying that brand love is, is perceived as one of the main objectives in brand management. Nevertheless, research into the factors influencing brand love is scarce. This paper aims to 
apply the theory of plant behavior to the context of brown lab and investigate several factors on brown lab, including attitude towards the brown lab. That is one coming from theory of the, um, the theory of plant behavior. And now number two, um, subjective norm, that is there, and perceived behavioral control. Now perceived behavioral control, he broke it into propensity to antrum for more for size means that try to apply human characteristics to the brand and then affordability to the brand. So that when you start to see, I love my brand, start to people try to see the brand as a human being. That when the brand does, when something goes wrong, the brand, the person begins to think that it affects the person as an with an emotional feel. So you begin to have emotions for the brand, adding human, human attributes to the brand. That's why that's why he has actually put it here. So he says that. This state is also um, moderated by involvement. The level of involvement is put out there. So this is another person using the child plan behavior to study brand lab, which leads to forgiveness. You can actually download the paper later and then read, read on it. Okay, so I'm just showing the different different theories and how people modify it and use it and apply them. So they go to different states. This is more of a recent study, 2017. Okay, so in 2003, building up from the theory of um, the, the decomposed theory of plant behavior. This gentleman, Venkatash, Morris, and Davis came up with this model. Now, if you remember, Davis is the one who did the theory of um, the technology asymptotes model. So you have got, and he said that there are other factors that can influence the person's intention to perform the behavior and then use the behavior. So they have got performance expectancy, effort expectancy, social influence and facilitating conditions. Remember, facilitating conditions was used in the theory of plant behavior. Now, all of these are leading towards behavioral intention, leading to use of use the use of the uh, the, the use the use behavior. But he now brought in moderators, gender, age, experience, and voluntarity, the voluntariness associated with it. So now he is now moving more from the plant behavior to the fact that the person has to have a voluntary use of the particular technology. So you're seeing this one coming in. All that I'm trying to realize is that the, 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 the technology, the, the models evolve and they build upon each other's work. The models evolve and they build upon in the, each other's work. Okay, now we are going to the examples of theories. Okay, I remember I will end up, I'll round up my session by talking about the level of theorization, by the examples of theories. So there are different, different examples of theories. To get the different types of theories. You can look at your academic supervisors, you can talk to them, or you can even check. There are so many categories of database of theories online. You can just type like the finance theories, or you can type business theories, or you can even type whatever course you are doing. Like I tell students that the easiest way to find a theory is to type the phenomenon and add theory, consumer behavior theory, and you put it in Google Scholar. You can find out different, different people who have come up with theories or concepts related to that particular uh, um, um, phenomenon of study. Okay, so in finance and in economics, we have so many types of theories. Arbitrage, arbitrage uh, pricing theory, model portfolio theory, rational choice theory, prospect theory, uh, Monte Carlo option model, binomial options pricing model, Gordon model. Somebody's asking that why, why are some called theories, why are some called models? I'll explain that later. Uh, arbitrage pricing theory, for example, gener addresses the general theory of asset pricing. So I'm not a finance major, but I just let you know, these are some of the theories that exist in finance. And there is also more, those which, you see, these are all different levels of assumptions. For example, those that look at economic cycles are Phillips curve, rational expectations, time consistency, financial accelerator. You can't use that one for growth. Growth theories also exist. Neoclassical growth, new growth theory. And these are economic theories. So they look at the economy. Okay. Those of you keep on logging off and logging on. I just want you to know that um, I'll be recording and by close of day, hopefully it will be online for you. The other one is ready. We are just ready to put it online. We, we need to edit the videos before we put them online. Okay. So, um, Patrick, welcome come back. Human capital theory, then you have economic systems. So economic systems like merchant, um, shock therapy, market socialism, Free capital, cap, free market capitalism. Then you have got schools of thought: Marxism, Keynesian, Neoclassical, Austrian school. Now let me explain something here. This is an economic capitalism. So you cannot say that you are using capitalism 
as a theory to study your home, to study um, um, uh, 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 how money is used in uh, a person's home or in the, the home of Ghanaians. But if you are studying economic system or you are studying them as a, an individual, as a capitalist, you can do that. Because this economic system acts, acts at the level of the economy, not at the level of an individual. So not know the level at which you are applying the theory. Okay. Then we are going, going to theories in marketing again. We have got uh, and theories in economics again. We have got tax-based theories, choice-based theories, market-based theory, invisible hand, property rights, polluter based theory, moral hazard, global trade, comparative and advantage. So all of them have got different, different levels that you can apply them. You can't pick a market theory and go and use it to study uh, uh, a market level theory. And this is this is market level theory is very is at the top level. You can't go and just go and use it to study an individual. You need to understand what you are, you are doing, okay, and how it has been applied. Then in accounting, you've got events approach, the behavior approach, human information processing approach, and uh, positive approach, and you've got the value approach and financial statements reporting and the events approach. All of them have different things that they look at when they are looking at financial statement reporting. For example, in the events approach, the income statement is perceived as a direct communication of operating events that occur in a given period. In other words, events re relevance rather than the output of cash flow determines whether it will be seen on the segment of cash flow or not. So if you're looking at a cash flow document or a uh, paper, you may be able to know that if a person uses a value approach, you may see something on it. If you use an events approach, you may see certain elements on it. Okay. Then we also have um, normative events approach which is actually in order for interested persons to better focus the future of social organization, organizations. The most relevant, the most relevant, okay, the most relevant attributes of the crucial events which affect the organization are aggregated for the periodic publication of free inferential, free of inferential bias. So the most relevant is what determines what goes there. So that's where they have the money normative. So accounting reports, then focus on most relevant attributes of the events crucial to the users before they we develop the report. That's interesting in accounting. Okay. So now we can go on to marketing. Marketing has so quite a number of theories too. Hierarchy of effects theory, the series of steps that a consumer goes through to be in which the consumer goes through to receive and use information in order to arrive at a decision. For example, to decision to purchase or not to purchase a product. So I've got awareness, knowledge, liking, preference, conviction, purchase. But at the first level is thinking, that's the first two. That's, so you need knowledge and awareness, then you go to feel, that has preference and then liking. And the last one, do, purchase and conviction. Okay. Then you've got the service quality model, which you talked about earlier. And then you've got choice in marketing. Choice in marketing has to do with the fact that um, you have so many other theories there, like the Porter's model, which is for management and it's also used in marketing, resource-based view of the firm, which is for management, which is also used in marketing. Institutional theory, which is from social science, which is also used in marketing. And then um, conduct, um, structure conduct performance model, why some industries are on average and others are more profitable than others. And efficiency perspective, why some firms in an industry are more profitable than others. So this is a look for more strategic theories, management strategies theories. Okay. Then you also have game theory, which finance also uses marketing also uses but it's a mathematical concept i told you you can pick from different disciplines and apply then i've got collective intelligence i've got generational marketing or generational theory which looks at different generations in society when by when by the age in which they were born the period in which they were born this is actually developed by the peer research company and then they actually use it to do research on generational studies okay then you have for what you can also do is to just look at the different fields of study and type add the word theory. So you can go to Google and add entrepreneurship, type entrepreneurship and add theory. You can type uh, motivation and add theory. You can type um, 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 service quality and add theory. You can, you can type, let's say, patient care and add theory in case you are in health, health service management. So you can just add the word theory to something, a, a concept, and then look for the theories related to that. Taylorism, it comes from Man management. I've come to um, Yvonne and Reginald's domain. So Taylor is one of the people who postulated a motivational theory. And then he tried to talk about the fact that workers do not naturally enjoy working, so they need close supervision and control. 
So workers should be given appropriate training tools, training and tools so that they can work efficiently as possible. Workers are then paid according to the number of items they produce in a set of period of time, piece rate pay. Now, what you see here is that as a result, so workers are encouraged to work hard and maximize their productivity. Okay, so his view is on motivation by pay. Okay. Then I've got Hesbeck. Hesbeck, who has close links to Maslow, believe in the two-factor theory of motivation. That means that the businesses could introduce that, which the business could introduce, that, that could directly motivate employees to work harder. One of the more of the hygiene factors, which, um, and another one could was more about the motivating factors. Now, the hygiene factors were, these were, there were also a factor that would demotivate an employee if not present and will not in themselves actually motivate the employee. So those are the hygiene factors or that creates an environment to be favorable for the person to be motivated. And you have got the motivating factors. Okay, motivators are, are concerned with the actual job itself. For instance, how interesting the work is and the opportunity it gives for extra responsibility, recognition and promotion. Hygiene factors has to do with factors that surround the, the job. That is, for example, a worker will not only turn up to work if only a business has provided, provided a reasonable level of pay and safe working conditions. But these factors will not make him work harder at his job once he is there. So he, he differentiated them. What will encourage you to motivate you to show up to work and what will make you to work, motivate you to work harder or make work better. Okay. Okay, so, um, Maslow too came up and introduced, came from the new human relations school and came, talked about the different incentives that workers should expect so that they can be motivated to work. And, they, and then, and this in turn are in a hierarchy. So he tried to talk about managers should recognize that workers are not motivated the same way and should not, and don't move up the hierarchy at the same pace. So you have to offer different level, types of incentives at different, for different workers at different levels in order to motivate them. So that one, we talked about such a thing like earlier. Then in public admin, you have got the new public management concept that has been there for some time, which holds the hypothesis that the market-oriented management for the public sector will lead to greater cost efficiency for governments without having negative side effects on other objectives and considerations. So some of the characteristics are budget cards, voucher system, accountability, the use of technology, personal management, improved accounting, freedom to manage, strategic planning and management, separation of provision and production, competition, customer one-stop shop concepts, or and privatization. All of these are new public management concepts. Okay. Um, there have been other people who have actually got new schools of thoughts about new public management concepts because they have argued that it didn't work out. Um, there's a guy who wrote a book that says that um, it didn't actually work well in certain countries because of the fact that sometimes public sector workers in privatization were making sure that um, um, we're giving contrast to people in the public, uh, public sector workers were giving contrast to people in the private sector. And then so that in, in later on, when they retire from the private sector, the public sector, they go and work in this same company. So they're making sure those people's companies were, were, were healthy by giving specific jobs to them. And, 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 and it affected um, the book. The book is called, I think, The Good Samaritan or The Bad Samaritans. I think The Bad Samaritans, I think so. It's a very interesting book about um, perspectives on uh, public man, uh, new public management. You can read it. Then you have um, information system. Information systems draws from social sciences and so many other disciplines. So you have got so many other theories, even from economics, we all use them. Resource based theory, theory of plan behavior, diffusion of innovation and then technology acceptance model. Okay, so the last part has to do with the level of a theory. Theories work at different levels, micro level, the meso level, and the macro level. So we need to know which level a theory is working, operating at so that we know how to apply it. Okay, so before I, I jump to anything, I just want to emphasize something here. Um, Um, just give me a second. I just want to emphasize. Um,
it's happening to me. I lost my connection. I'm back. Okay, so I just come to round up. Um, okay, so in the in our book, I just want to say, show something here. Okay, in our book, there is a a section of um, a section that explains the level of terrorization, and I don't have it on my slide, so I just want to use this one. This is one of my papers that I wrote. So, so conceptual approaches are also differentiated according to a hierarchy, moving from shallow conceptualization to deeper theoretical based approaches. The first one is, is the theoretical based approach, which makes clear use of identifiable theory. Identifiable theory that can be tested or applied. So when we say a theoretical based approach, it means that a person is using a study, doing a study in which there's a particular theory in it. You can see the you, you, you can see the theory and then you can actually note the name of the theory. So somebody may be doing a study and the name of the theory is evident in the you can actually be able to read that theory and um, know the theory and then identify it. So the theory of plan behavior, so the theory of reason action, all those theories can be there. Then, framework-based approaches, which use a framework for analysis, which is derived from a body of theoretical work. So sometimes somebody's work that he's carrying out, he may develop what we call a framework. A framework-based analysis means that he may just read the literature and develop a, a, a framework from the literature or a combination of literature and, and, and theory, not an identifiable theory as one, but different, different frameworks and um, different different um, readings and he developed his own framework to carry out the study so that's what we call a framework based approach then we've got model based approach models are applied with with, with without reference to deeper body of knowledge so models are used are just points of classifying and categorizing things so so sometimes somebody wants to say something um uh, the, the, the banking model. So the banking model could be in two. The retail banking is a banking model, and then commercial banking is a banking model. So you could have different types of banking models. So you can categorize his work based on different types of banking models. The retail banking literature, the what are the factors that influence retail banking, what are the factors that influence uh, commercial banking, and then he's using the model-based approach. Model does not depend on any deeper body of knowledge. It is just using them. It's just using them um, to be able to um, explain differences between one or two things. Okay, I'll come back again and explain and give you examples of all these things again. Then you also have concept-based approach. Concept makes use of a defined concept, a defined concept to be able to um, carry out a study. So it may be called a concept like information property is a concept. That can be used to explain or the ripple effect is a concept that may not all of these concepts are not necessarily theoretically grounded but they can use it to explain um, an issue okay then you have a category based approach that make use of a prescribed set of factors to to carry out analysis and usually you see that's one on factor based models so you just put the factors together and point them to something and you use them to uh, point them to an outcome and use them to do this analysis now, what we are trying to emphasize here is that in everybody's work that he carries out, you see this step, these types of things, theoretical based model, framework based model, model based approaches, and then um, concept based approaches and category based approaches. Now, let me ask, let me answer the million dollar question that you have in mind. So why is it that you have something called technology acceptance model? Is it a model or is it a theory? Okay, so at the formation of the Sometimes at the formation of a particular um, and that's a, 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 I, don't, I don't want to use a model or any at the formation of a particular frame to carry out a research, somebody may give it a name. So for example, the time that Davis created the technology acceptance model, he was just talking about factors that influence and the acceptance of technology. He said that it's perceived usefulness and perceived use of use, which lead to intention, lead to actual usage behavior. At that time, he was just saying that this is a model of factors, using them to, and he then he went out to test them. 
So at the time it was developed, it was called technology acceptance model. The, the, that talks about the factors that uh, predict the acceptance of technology. So there could be, and he actually mentioned that there could be so many factors, but he has classified them into these perceived usefulness, perceived use of use, and, 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 and leading to um, behavioral intention. Now, when he did it, the name was accepted. But as we are applying it and as applying it, people came up with um, technology acceptance uh, model one, then somebody refined it and had acceptance model two, as, then a model three. It has been refined and critiqued a lot, and now we have technology acceptance model four. And some of them have evolved from the word technology acceptance model and moved on to another one called the unified theory of um, unified theory UTAUT. Oh, I've forgotten the full meaning, but unified um, theory of acceptance and usage of technology. Okay, so that's what it's called unified theory of acceptance and usage of technology. And that is the one I showed you on my slides. So after some time, people have developed, and Venkatash came to develop that one. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is that the name technology acceptance model still exists because at the time that he came up with, that was the name that he had. And that it has not been changed. But even the model itself today, if you go and see, are using it, nobody, quite a number of people will not be happy because it has been critiqued so many times and better models have come out since then. But the name model is used because at the time that it was from, it was a model just telling you without a reference to deeper body of knowledge. And later on, it was again, it became a theory. So that's why some of them are still having the word no, the name, the name of theory is not there. It was conceptual as a model, not based on a deeper reference of knowledge. Now, somebody would then ask that what about the different, the, the schematic part of it? It's not all theoretical frameworks or um, theories that have schematic diagrams. Some of them might be equations, some of them might be a sentence, a, a sentence that of explanation. Okay. So you have got the theory-based approaches. In, so when you're looking at people's work, you see that either it's a theory-based approach, the person has taken a theory and uses it as a clearly, uses it as for his, the whole analysis and then base, everything is based on the theory. Then in some time, people's work are based on framework. They develop a framework from the reading, different, different reading, develop a framework and they use that one to do their study. Then sometimes people use models as part of their work. They may pick a model, they may develop a model which is not deeper, body of knowledge, but if they can even take it from practice and use it to be able to do the work. But then there are others who also take um, concept-based approaches. So the concept is what is used for discussion, the ripple effect concept, information poverty concept. There are people who write papers based on concepts. And there are people who also write papers based on categories. They categorize a personal price, you got technological factors, organizational factors, and then this is environmental factor. Then they just discuss by based on the different categories. So there are category-based approaches. Sometimes there's a very thin line trying to differentiate them, but I'm just like the highest form of um, usage of theory is what we call the theoretical, theoretical um, inspired works or the theoretical based approaches. Those are the highest form that you see. Okay. Okay, so now um, I, I have finished and I want to take your questions. I saw rather there was an argument taking place. <laughs> okay, I like this question. Uh, please, you can ask your question. You can unmute yourself and ask your question if you want to ask a question. Blue. Yeah. I'm here. Yes, Thomas. I'm here. Um, good morning. Good morning. It's been a long time. Yes. Okay. Tom. I've asked this question before in the class, and uh, what you've been explaining today uh, reemphasize what you told me in class. Now, I find I wanted to find out what is the difference between concept, uh, model, and then theory. And I quite remember that the little explanation that you give the little understanding I had was that the model concept are early stages of theories and therefore some of the concept over the time or models over the time can be theories and sometimes with some of the theories 
Or some models are core models, not because they are not up to theories, but because the initial owners or the initial originators of Yeah, Thomas, we can hear you. Okay, so um, what you are saying is true. Those the models of, models of what is called model. Okay. Yes. So that is you are right. what Thomas, 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 you are right. You are right by saying what you are saying. That sometimes the initial owners don't change the name. But I just also want to, and you are saying that the, the concept, the mod, uh, model and the categories are early stage of theories. Okay. What you are saying is, yes, is, is true, but it's also not true in the sense that it's, 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 those, those classifications are being used by, uh, but the disclaimer is that the classifications were done by my PhD supervisor, Richard Hicks. He did it in literature and everybody's using it around the world. Okay, so um, um, his concept was that it is more about how people use the thing in their work, in their work and, the, and how the thing came to stay. So sometimes somebody will just shallowly just take something and then give it a name and start using it for his explanations of things. For example, let me just give an example. There is what we call the effect of mobile phones on, 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 on a business. We call them incremental effects. Then you have got um, um, transformation effects and then you have got production effects. Now, this particular thing, somebody asks, that, is it a category? Is it a model? Is it a, 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 a concept? And then is it what? So what he did is that he studied different, different things concerning how people, the result, the outcome of using um, um, mobile phones. And then he came up of, out of the, with this particular concepts and then put together in a model. So incremental is a concept. Transformation is a concept. Production is a concept. They are all concepts that exist. And then he put it together in one, the three together as a model to say that if you're looking at the effects of mobile phones, you can look at these three things. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Good. So now as we are using it in literature, using it in literature, somebody can then end up theorizing. Now when you finish theorizing, by the time you finish theorizing, you have the concepts and how to measure them, the proposition between the, the concepts, the assumptions, and then the logic. Sometimes when all these building blocks are not there, they are at the shallow level. I hope you now get it. Yes, I agree. Good. But Prof, so oh, man, the, the more you have all of them being there, then you are getting closer to the theory form. Okay, 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 okay. Um, um, but, but one thing I want to also put across is that uh, you, in the course of your lecturing, you said there is a uh, theory sample, or some, some theories are poor theories, or some theories can be classified as poor, or yes. some can be classified as good. Yes. As good. But my challenge, my challenge here is that in the course of your lecturing, and this is not the first time, at least for the, the first lecture I wasn't part, but I'm talking about the classroom one. Your example is always the simplistic type, which is length times bread. <laughs> length times bread. But to be honest, I know majority of my colleagues are also going through challenge, the challenge I'm going through. And in, 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 in the things you are teaching, I don't know, maybe my basis are not strong or I don't have the strong legs to understand some of the concepts. To be honest, most of them are more of abstract and understand PAD work is supposed to be complex. So but my argument here is that your example is always the simplest, which anybody at all can understand and apply. But in reality, uh, the lectures are a bit complex. And most of us, and I believe we can't across almost everybody. That is why we ask most people to ask questions, people can ask the questions. And I wish we can use a known concept, sorry, is a breed, a known, a known, a known theory to, to illustrate or explain to us. This theory is a good theory because it satisfies all these factors. This theory may not be as good as this because it doesn't satisfy all these theories. So okay. that some of us will the concept very well uh, and the, we can learn from there. Because see, once you have the basis, then we can build upon. You see, I can't say this theory is good or is bad because of the about, about application. 
what are you applying it to do for? A theory has to explain a particular phenomenon. A theory may not be good for you, but it may be good for somebody, depending on the phenomenon of interest. So I was giving you an example that somebody goes to develop this category-based work. Let me just use that one again. This political instability, low wages, and on um, um, let's talk start up capital, high interest rate to unemployment. But they are all acting at different, different levels. So how are you going to operationalize this one? How are you going to analyze? Because some of them are industry level factors. Some of them are um, 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 national level factors. Some of them are individual or firm level factors. So how then are you going to actually analyze this one? So it means that you have to look at it in different levels. So you may have to develop and say that these are the and national level factors or the macro level factor that influence unemployment. And these are the uh, um, um, industrial level factor. These are the firm level and these are the individual level factors. Then if you are carrying out your study, we know which of the levels are you looking at in your study. Then in that case, your model, you can then give us a better understanding. What students do is that they collapse all the factors together and it makes the, their framework or whatever they are trying to postulate very weak because the level of analysis is so high. It's a mixture of different levels and people can understand it. Thank you, sir. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Another thing is that uh, I can take something like chair of plan behavior. I can take a moral hazard, like moral hazard is in economics, uh, it's in economics and finance. And I go and apply it to looking at uh, managing uh, food in the house. It doesn't apply to that one. The level of used to work, it doesn't mean the concept and the construct doesn't apply. But I'm forcing it to use it in that scenario. So it doesn't work in such a scenario. So sometimes the, thing, the, the problem is not that the theory itself is weak, it is how you are applying it and where you are applying it is making it weak. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Yes, sir. Okay, then, any other question? Oh, yeah, I you? wanted to ask you something. Good morning. Okay, good morning. Uh, uh, Prof, actually, you mentioned that the research based questions. Uh, your research questions should basically be based on a theory if possible. Uh, so yes, my it, question... It could, it, it could be. And that is, it's not composed yes. because some studies cannot, it's not all studies that can do that. Especially if there are different theories you are using at different levels, are different for each question. You can't actually just make your theory be based on that. Yes. Right. right. So because that, that is what my confusion was because sometimes the if you try and do that, then the, the your research might take a completely different direction than what you actually maybe uh, initially started it with if you try and uh, base it on a theory initially. Yeah. Right, right, Prof. That was what I wanted to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, good morning, Prof. Good morning. Yeah, please, uh, I want to find out if I want to modernize somebody's theory to suit a particular study, do I need permission from the original author of the theory? No. No. But you have to cite the person. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. We don't have any more questions. Yeah. Yvonne, do you have a question? I saw you have unmuted yourself. Hello, Yvonne. Hello? Yes. You are fine. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Isaac, your question that you're asking to whether we should propagate um, our own theories from Africa and all kinds of stuff. There are people who do studies on indigenous African concepts and how they can be theorized. Um, but you should also know that it's a political game that you have in. You have also compete with scientists from different, different parts of the world. The Guangxi issue in China like this has been used in a lot of academic studies because it is they have been able to conceptualize it the way that people can apply it in studies. So if, um, and in Ghana, maybe there may be um, certain Jin Yame and all those kind of, some of our um, Christ symbols that we apply in society. 
and we can actually study mm -hmm. them and how how they, they yeah, it could be it could be somebody can even use in his PhD. My question is that the problem we have is we have not actually codified our our culture very well so that we can actually use it for us. So it's a combination of works. Somebody may have to codify it from um, from literature in literature in like linguistics and then in drama and in in, in culture and anthropology and then somebody goes to pick it and then use it in business school. The issue that you may also have is that our our business settings in which we do our research have become modernized like a Western environment. So we can't, it's very difficult to use African-based things to be able to use it to study it. For example, Dangote in becoming Dangote or Despite in becoming Despite, um, um, all these big mm -hmm. business people may have built their principles on sound yeah. economic principles, not on any um, Japanese-based uh, logic of, of society or, or looking at the human being. But if you go to those places, they are part of their culture, and those things influence their, the way they look at, into, in, at society, they look at, and they do business and everything. And even if you go to Islamic countries like this, even the way they do business is influenced by their religion. But you don't have it much in Ghana. You have a plurality of concepts and ideas and people schooling from so many different places, managing their companies. So they are influenced by these things and it affects the way we, we look at look at our typical chieftaincy place and, and, and environment or towns that have chiefs in it. Everybody wants a chief who has gone to school to come back and be their chief. And as soon as a person goes to school, he's coming back with a Western concept to come and help rule the town. It's not wrong, but I'm just trying to understand that these are the challenges of studying things from an African perspective. What you should say is that not necessarily African-based theories, but we can take existing theories to understand, to try to study businesses in Africa and try to look out or in developing countries, look out the weaknesses in which the theories don't apply. So we have to challenge the theories and bring in new variables that can help the theory apply. Those are the part where we can contribute. No, no, prof, I, was, I wasn't actually looking at African-based theories. So I'm looking at theories coming from Africa. So if, if you're looking for theories in human what, resources, what, what, what is theories coming from Africa? What is theories coming from Africa? In terms of in terms of the author, in terms of the author, where it is originating from. Well, you're making it not necessarily that. Yeah, yeah, you're making a mistake. Who is actually coming from? Which author is actually coming from here? People are schooling okay. in the US and coming back and come and teach here. But when sometimes they publish, they write the US school they entered so that they can get accepted into a particular uh, uh, journals. Some people are, 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 are affiliates in, in, in universities in South Africa and stuff. They write a paper, they write University of Ghana. And then sometimes they write a paper, they write uh, uh, um, University of Cape Town. So who is the Afri who is the Afri um, an African author? And there are people who are even like William Steele and Co, who are even foreign people who are living in Ghana and writing from working in University of Ghana and they are writing uh, from here. And there are people who are in Harvard and, and, and other universities and they write just on Africa, even more than the people who are even in Africa here. So where do you say you have African theories? I like the perpetrator patriotism, but I think that we also have to step up and do good work, whether you are in Africa or in Africa or wherever you are. It's nice to go and see journals and you can see African names among the top journals too. That's what you are saying and I agree with you. Okay, so I want to find out that the last speaker means by modernizing um, someone's theory to be used for a show. So it's, it's, more about, it's more about adaptation, adaptation, adapting the theory taking the theory and adapting it to your work or modify it to use it to your work. That's why you say modernizing. And you end up coming to enhance it or test it or challenge it. So thank you very much for the class. I don't see any question coming up anymore. Um, if you don't have a question on this one or a question for... Um, you need the slide concerning Jojo. All the slides are on, on Sakai. I don't have the slides. All the slides are on Sakai. You can go there and download them. So I'll put the video that we did last week. We have finished editing it um, a little bit. Well, I'll put it on today. And I'll likely also put on today, if we are able to finish editing this one, clean it up. I'll put this one to there today so that you can actually download them. Thank you very, very much. It's been a very long two and a half, two hours, two hours, 45 minutes.
Thank, you, Thank you so much, Prof. Prof. Yeah. Prof. Yes. The, the, the issue of our Vodafone and data has not been resolved because of the lockdown. 